Hello, and welcome to the Kids and Teen Stream. We have an exciting lineup for you today, and we will be welcoming our first host, Patricia Storms, to tell you all about it. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Watts Toronto operates on land that is the territory of the Huron Wendat and Paytoon First Nations, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Anishinaabeg and allied nations to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people with long histories on this land. We are privileged to live, work, and create in this territory and strive to act with awareness and solidarity. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy wherever you're tuning in from. Now, please welcome your host, Patricia Storms. Hi, Patricia. Hi. So, Hello. Pat Hi. Patricia is an illustrator, author of children's books and humor books. She loves to draw, paint, write, sing, dance, play the ukulele, and dream. She has illustrated many children's books, including 13 Ghosts of Halloween, The Ghost Goes Spooking, If You're Thankful and You Know It, and By the Time You Read This. She also enjoys writing stories. She has written and illustrated The Pirate and the Penguin and the much-loved Never Let You Go. Her newest story, Moon Wishes, co-written with her husband Guy Storms, is published by Groundwood Books and is illustrated by Milan Pavlovic. Hello, Patricia. It's Hi, good so morning. It's great, great to have you. you Wonderful well. to be here. It's a great introduction. Thanks Amazing. a lot. No problem at all. So I'm going to leave the stage off awesome. to you, and I will get out of here. All right. Hi. So welcome, everybody, to um, Kids and Teen Stream. And I'm Patricia Storms, and I'm here to introduce some fabulous people. So let's not waste any time. I want to get right to introducing the first book, My Day with Gong Gong by Senna Yi. Now, Senna Yi is from Toronto, Ontario, mm -hmm. where she writes poetry, short stories, and film criticism. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Her first book, the creative nonfiction collection, How Do I Look, was published by Metatron Press in 2017. But now she has her first picture book, mm -hmm. My Day with Gong Gong. So welcome, Senna. Thank you. Oh, it's so good to be here. <laughs> Wonderful. So are you going to read some of the story to us this morning? Yeah, I'm going to read like a little teaser um, so you can just get an idea of May's adventures in Chinatown with her gong gong. <laughs> All right. Let me just... Okay, I'll do my best to show the drawings Beautiful. after too. <laughs> All right. Oh, oops. Next page, actually. All right. Inside a gift shop, the cashier waves at us. Neho, he says. He chats with Gong Gong in Chinese. I look at the glass counter display. Jade earrings, cotton slippers, and small toy animals. The monkey is my favorite because it's my Chinese zodiac sign. My tummy grumbles. I pull on Gong Gong's sleeve. Can we eat? I ask. He pats my head and smiles, but that's not what I asked for. There's little May and her Gong Gong. That's her grandpa. And here's the gift shop that they're in. Oh, yeah. yeah, and she loves a little monkey, monkey toy down here. <laughs> Gong Gong takes us to the dim sum restaurant next. Maybe he understood me after all. Neho, says Gong Gong. The cooks nod back as they wrap dumplings with their hands. Carts of food pass us by. Yummy pork buns, fried turnip cake, mango pudding. I'm so hungry. Can we eat? I ask Gong Gong again, but he only orders tea. Oh, I'm getting hungry just looking at this. I know. And she must be really yeah, hungry. So is May. <laughs> <laughs> Poor May. <laughs> Next is the supermarket. Gong Gong buys groceries, fish, tofu, and vegetables. Mgoi says Gong Gong when the cashier hands him his bags. I help Gong Gong carry them. They're heavy. I hope we can eat soon. Chinatown is always busy. Cars, streetcars, and bicycles zoom by. When it's time to cross the street, Gong Gong holds my hand. Everyone's in a rush. I pull on Gong Gong's hand, but he's a pretty slow walker, so I have to slow down too. I wish he'd hurry up. Some busy Chinatown scenes. So you can that looks, and I, it looks yeah. just like Chinatown that I remember. Yeah, 
the Toronto Toronto street no, was, there in the background. Oh, and here's some groceries at the grocery store. Yummy fish. <laughs> Gong Gong's friends are playing cards and feeding pigeons in the park. I thought we were going home to eat. Gong Gong gives me some cards. His friends look at me and smile. Daft Yi, says one of his friends. They all laugh, but I'm not doing anything funny. Uh-oh, May is getting, getting even hungrier. <laughs> I can't understand Gung Gung's friends. I don't know how to play this game. And we've been sitting here for so long. I throw down my cards. Pigeons keep poking at crumbs near my feet. Go away, I yell. I stomp and run through them and they all fly away. Ew, a pigeon pooped on my coat. <laughs> that made me laugh out loud. <laughs> Poor May. May is not having a good day. <laughs> Ah, yeah, Gung Gung and his friends laugh when they see my poopy coat. I cover <laughs> my face and cry. Gung Gung stops laughing. He walks over and reaches into his pocket. He takes out a tissue and helps me clean off the poop. He reaches into another pocket and gives me two small bags. <gasps> it's the toy monkey from the gift shop. How did Gung Gung know that that one was my favorite? I open the other small bag pork buns from the dim sum restaurant. Mm. How did Gong Gong know that these are my favorite? Hmm? <laughs> Just a couple more. Oh, thank you, Doshe, I say. Gong Gong smiles. We sit by the water fountain and eat the pork buns. Some pigeons try to eat our crumbs. Gong Gong stands up and waves his arms to scare them away from me. Aww. And that's all I'll read for now, <laughs> but yeah, you can check out the book to see what else May and her grandpa if get you want to, to read the whole story, <laughs> yes, be sure to purchase the book. So, um, yeah, I, lots of um, questions sort of pop in my head. Obviously, mm -hmm. the first one that comes is, was there a specific event that inspired this story? Or was it just generally based on your childhood? What, what yeah, inspired so what? What compelled you to write the story? Yeah, so it was actually my little sister. I'm not sure she's watching now, but a shout out to my little sister who gave me the Yay! idea to the story. Um, I was trying to think of what kind of um, children's story I could write. And she came up with the idea of writing about our, our grandpa and a day in Chinatown. Um, and I just loved the idea. Um, so uh, Gong Gong in the story is kind of like a combination of <laughs> some of my grandparents. Um, so uh, most of them mostly spoke uh, Cantonese and um, we grew up not um, not understanding Cantonese and and many of my grandparents didn't speak much English. And so I thought it'd be interesting to kind of write about uh, growing up just with that kind of difference of culture and language between them. Um, so how, so, how did you communicate? Uh, we mostly, we would have like my parents would help translate. So I, that's also why um, in the beginning of the story, uh, May is a little nervous because her mom is kind of like, Hi May, you know, have a good time with your grandpa. And it's like, oh no, my translator. <laughs> um, that was kind of like a feeling I sometimes had as a kid of like, oh wait, but how will I be able to talk to my grandparents if no one's there to kind of like help translate? Um, but there are other ways I, I found just of like connecting, whether it's just like watching TV and being able to laugh at the same things or exactly or liking the same food. Yeah, eating food very important. <laughs> um, yeah, it's so a, definitely it's a great connector, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so um, I, what I yeah. love about the story is that. Um, you know, obviously Gong Gong is um, smarter than she realizes. Yeah. And he's, very, he's obviously very perceptive, even if he can't communicate. He he has he loves his granddaughter so much. He's going to notice all of the things that she likes, and and it's yeah. just so wonderful that um, that comes out in the yeah, story. Yeah, totally. I have like a really fond memory of my of my Gong Gong. Um, he would kind of like when we would go over and visit him. He would do this like funny dance and go into the kitchen and we'd like follow him and copy it and we always knew it was because he was going to get us uh, popsicles from the freezer <laughs> and I was thinking the other day I'm like oh were those just for us I mean maybe he also enjoyed them but it's kind of like this sweet realization that he just always had those ready for when his grandkids would come visit um, that's wonderful yeah. <laughs> and I had mentioned to you beforehand like my mother is from Jamaica and when I was a young young child um, and I was first introduced to my Jamaican family um, I went uh, to Jamaica in, I believe it was 1970, and I was quite young. And mm -hmm. they, they all, these people scared me because mm -hmm. they were so different. 
um, they were very, very loud. And at that point, I wasn't, I wasn't loud and they would speak so quickly. And I couldn't understand a word they were saying. And I was actually a little bit scared of my grandparents because right. they were so foreign from what I had experienced. But mm -hmm. eventually, like you say, um, language sort of comes in different forms and it doesn't yeah. necessarily have to be words. Although yeah, totally. there are words at the end of the book, a uh, nice little glossary. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to first, I'm assuming, even before I read the glossary, gong gong, I'm assuming meant grandfather. Yes, yeah, it's grandfather um, on your mother's side. So what is grandfather on your father's side? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. And yeah. I love, how do you say I love you in Cantonese? Oh, uh, noi oi ne. Sorry in advance for my pronunciation, but, but um, yeah, noi oi ne. But it's, it's just such a wonderful way to introduce a family story, but also, you know, once again, different cultures in Toronto, mm -hmm. you know, be reminded of all the beautiful things that Toronto has, especially, you know, Chinatown. I, I haven't been to Chinatown in a while and I do miss mm -hmm. it. Yeah, and, I miss yeah. it too. Dim sum, yeah. I, miss, I miss going out for dim sum and <laughs> yeah, dim just sum. being able to shop. So lovely. And, yeah. I'm curious, what did you think when you first saw the illustrations? Oh, I when I, yeah. So the illustrations are by Elaine Chen, um, who's a, an artist in BC. And yeah, the first time I even saw like the the like character sketches, I like burst into tears. <laughs> I, I did not expect to be like that that emotionally, emotionally, you know, affected. But I like couldn't believe it, and I just I just said yes, yes. You know, I love them, and just everything she did, I, oh, I fully wonderful. trusted her. And it was really funny actually seeing the kinds of. Um, Overlaps. Like I, I didn't give her any references of my. That own. was going to be my question. Did right. you buy <laughs> pictures of your own grandfather? Yeah. So, you so I didn't. But then Literally. something kind of amazing was that she already like things that I thought can kind of maybe a bit selfishly, but were so specific to my own gong gong. It was amazing realizing like, oh, this is kind of universal to like you know all grandparents, or especially like you know um like Asian grandparents just like how like their stamps and like certain like their their cap and the vest and like little things but like that were just. It. She already captured it and she was like, oh, yeah, like I looked at my own, you know, references of her own grandparents and then her friend's grandparents. So it was just oh, really excellent. nice seeing, seeing that captured. <laughs> oh, that's so lovely. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm just curious, um, are there more gong gong stories? Oh, or none right now. But I know that I actually just the other day on Instagram, somebody was like, are there other stories with the rest of the grandparents? And I was like, that's a pretty good idea. I, you know, you yeah. very well milk this quite, quite deeply. <laughs> yeah, um, so not right now, but I definitely would be open to it. Uh, it was and, really I, and I love the humor of it and the sweetness. <laughs> like you've, you've captured so many beautiful emotions in, oh, in this, this uh, small story. And it's just so heartwarming. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, it was really, it was really fun to write. I, I, yeah, just writing, it, it is my first kid's book and just yeah, getting into kind of like the, the spirit and energy of like May was, was really fun and important to me to make sure that I, that I could get it right. And, um, and yeah, and have fun too. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I'm just, um, cause I write picture books as yeah. well. I'm just curious, like, was it, um, in terms of the process, um, cause a lot of times people ask how long did it take you to write the picture book? And sometimes mm -hmm. picture book stories come very quickly. And other times it can take years to, to get it quite right. I was just curious about mm -hmm. the, the time process for yeah, you. Yeah, so um, it was actually quite fast from when I got, like it took me a while to think of the idea, but once my little sister gave me the idea, I'm pretty sure I sent like a first draft, like I'm pretty sure I just like type, 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 like in a day, like it was just like, here you go. And then and then my wonderful editor, Claire, was really helpful with um, helping me find like more conflict in the story. Like the first draft, um, I think it was, it was just May and Gong Gong like having a great day and there's kind of like not much of a story to it. Yeah. Um, so Claire really helped me kind of, yeah, figure out what kinds of like tensions could maybe come out of this kind of relationship. Um, but yeah, it was actually quite fast. I, I feel like it was like a month. Yeah, like writing the story was maybe like a day and then the like editing was more of the longer. Yeah, that, that's the longer process. Yeah. And so um, one of the things when uh, an author works with an illustrator, you did you communicate to her at all? Because that's something that um, most of the time the author and illustrator generally don't talk to each other mm -hmm. while they're working on the project. Yeah, was, no, we didn't. Not... Yeah, that, that was accurate. We, we didn't um, communicate or well, I got um, like early sketches and then um, I think like then the pencil sketches and then like a color version. But I, mm. I kept just like, and it was great and was like, oh, you know, do you have any notes? And I was like, no, this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> like I, was, I couldn't even think of anything. I was like, this is exactly and more like than I ever could have dreamt of. Um, so yeah. delightful. <laughs> 
But um, yeah, I, I would like to, uh, I think I would like to have uh, more stories with um, other family members. So right. what, is the, what is the Cantonese word for grandmother? Oh, uh, for on your mother's side is popo, and popo, then oh, um, yeah, and then father's side is ying yin. Um, so I could yeah, I could write about the other <laughs> the other grandparents and see what kinds of adventures they get up to. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And um, are are you um, uh, a lover of picture books yourself? I'm assuming you read quite a few as well. Yeah, definitely. It was like yeah, definitely a dream to work with Anik. I, I grew up reading so many Anik Press books. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, I. I definitely want to read, yeah, keep reading more, especially as I just kind of get more into the picture children's picture book world now after this. Um, so uh, are there plans for you to perhaps um, do a little tour at all? Oh, a tour. Oh, yeah. I Well, I have some virtual, yeah, virtual launches <laughs> planned, yeah, for um, closer to November. Um, yeah, then I'm hoping to keep doing some little like Instagram live or um, like bedtime reading <laughs> kind of things uh, for kids, which would be fun. Um, but yeah, hopefully when when it's safe, <laughs> I can go. Yeah, I'd love to be able to go to to schools and to classes and and be able to to see kids reading the book too. Is would be amazing. <laughs> it's very heartwarming. And so, who was who? What who who was the one? Was it your idea to also have the glossary at the end? Oh, it was actually Claire's idea, my editor. Yeah. So I I that was a um, good idea as well. Yeah, totally. I and it also just helped me learn more. Um, yes, yeah, so I mentioned I, I, I don't speak much Cantonese aside from, yeah, like hello and, and some, dim sum, <laughs> some dim sum items so I can or make my order. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was also just really interesting to learn more about um, just all the differences even between um, like all the different dialects and, and pronunciations and things like that. Um, so I have to, had to ask friends and family and, and the internet <laughs> um, for, for some of that. Um, but even that was, yeah, a really great learning experience. <laughs> Yeah, and then it just, you know, goes to show that, you know, communication comes in different ways and different levels. And ultimately, the, I know it sounds a little perhaps corny, but the communication of love is, yeah. you know, you don't necessarily need a lot of words. Definitely. Um, and I, I, I just, I'm really, I really like that you put poop in the story, too. <laughs> My mom said that just last week. She was like, oh, yeah, people are going to like that you put the word poop in. Oh, um, <laughs> I have yet to be able to, to do that in a story. I've tried. <laughs> And it hasn't worked for me. Um, I, I, you can I was it. a child who loved the humor of poop. And yeah. so as soon as I read that, I was like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> I'm so happy. Like, I remember when I wrote it, I was like, let's see if I can get away with it. It's like, yes. Well, it's a pigeon, so. Yeah, totally yeah. fine. It's, it's just it's another opportunity to show the sweetness of Gong Gong. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, they're all like laughing at first. But then when he sees that, yeah, that she's upset, it's like, okay, let's, let, let's and, take And the whole concept of misunderstanding, like she doesn't know why they're laughing. Yeah. She's really getting frustrated. She feels misunderstood, which, you know, mm -hmm. many children do. Yeah, I really. They don't feel as if they have a voice. Mm -hmm. That was really important. Yeah. To, to have somebody who understands you you know yeah even when you don't when you don't feel like it you don't realize do. yeah, yeah yeah that was really important just kind of making sure that kids who might feel the same way um yeah with their grandparents or whoever um to know that that's okay um and that yeah there are just other ways of, of connecting with of people. communicating and connecting yeah Aww. such a warm-hearted book <laughs> thanks um, <laughs> and, and and could you tell me a little bit about uh, any of the other work that you've done Oh yeah, so um, so I've written a short. My first poetry collection uh, it was called "How Do I Look" uh, with Metatron Press, who I love. <laughs> um, so that was a short, um, short little book, um, and they all were kind of like uh, poetic prose about pop culture and movies. Um, my background's in film, um, so a lot of it was about um, yeah, about pop culture and and the things I was watching and growing up. Um, and that's how uh, Claire from Anik uh, first reached out to me, is because she had read that book and was like, "Hmm, have you ever considered?" Writing, <laughs> writing uh, yeah. children's books. Because if you, I mean, writing for film, I think in some ways is quite similar to writing a picture book. Yes, um, yeah. It's all about storyboarding, and mm, totally, and it's visual. such a beautiful, mm -hmm. smooth transition. Oh, and okay. if you, oftentimes, you know, writing poetry, well, a picture book is is like poetry as well. Yeah, totally. That kind of like very succinct and visual um, writing. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I found there are lots of words. Getting the right words. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm sure there's a lot of um, children out there who are going to relate to uh, this story and oh um, that uh, 
you uh, get to tell some more stories in the future. Yeah, I hope, I hope so too. And I hope that you can include the word poop in the future. <laughs> in the future one of yours. <laughs> okay. All right. So, My Day with Gong Gong by Senna Yi. Yeah. And published by Anik. <laughs> and could bring it right to the front. Show it, oh, yeah. show it off. There's so, May and Gong Gong. It's a beautiful book full of lots of heart. And enjoy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patricia. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> And now we're going to talk about Maggie's Treasures by John Eric Lapano. John Eric Lapano is a person who stays up too late working on curious things. I kind of know that feeling. <laughs> I'm curious about the curious things, including writing books for children, uh, his debut picture book, Tokyo Digs a Garden, I remember that one, that was beautiful, was the winner of the Governor General's Literary Award. John Eric lives in Stratford, Ontario with his wife three daughters, and a growing collection of things that glitter. I'm curious about that. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> welcome. Hi, thank you. So happy to be here. Yeah. Yeah. So would you um, uh, like to read the story first? I'm not quite sure, sure how you want to proceed. Yeah, absolutely. I've got, a, I've got the book right here, so I could read a little uh, teaser, as Senna did, just to, to kind of you know, build interest yes, <laughs> in the story. So it's uh, Maggie's Treasure. And it's illustrated by Kellen Hatanaka, who did the beautiful pictures. So we'll uh, we'll get started, and I'll try to show the try to show the photos as we go. Maggie had an eye for finding treasure through parks, along pathways, and in the nooks of her neighborhood. She went hunting a dropped button, a bottle cap, a bright red feather, a shiny stone. Maggie saw the sparkle in everything. Her collection started small, as many things do. A tiny piece here, another bit there. She filled a box, then a drawer, then a chest. People in the neighborhood noticed the curious girl. They thought she was picking up trash. Ms. Pims from next door praised her for it. The city workers welcomed the help. Hearing of Maggie's good deeds, even the mayor presented her with a special award. I like the mayor. Yeah, I love his sandals. <laughs> <laughs> Detail right there. <laughs> He's pretty hip. Yeah. Over time, Maggie's appetite for treasure grew bigger and bigger and bigger until Maggie's collection had grown to an unreasonable size. Uh oh. Oh dear becoming a bit of a hoarder, you might say. <laughs> Treasure filled the cupboards, corners, and closets of her house. It spilled out from under her bed. Treasure hung from the trees and lay scattered across the garden. Her home stood out on the street like a menagerie of the strange and forgotten. People in the neighborhood were beginning to talk. Uh -oh. A little bit of an unsightly mess, I would say. <laughs> hey, she's a kid. It, it, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Ms. Pims no longer approved. Oh, With man. nothing left to clean up, the city workers were so bored they began grooming the squirrels. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Complaints flew into the mayor's office. Haunted by regret, the mayor was having trouble sleeping at night. Oh, no. Sort of fever dream of all the town's complaints. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's what happens when you're mayor. That's right. One afternoon, Maggie's parents spoke up. Enough treasure, her father said. There's no more room, said her mother. I know this feeling all too well. I have three daughters of my own, so. <laughs> Stuff happens. Mm -hmm. Maggie stomped to her bedroom where she sat and stewed like an emperor surrounded by great piles of riches. But looking around, even Maggie could see that something had to be done. What do people do with treasure, she wondered. They hide it in caves and guard it with dragons. They sink it to the bottom of the ocean in treasure chests. They bury it and mark it with a giant X. Considering her options, Maggie watched a bird 
pluck a shiny red ribbon from the bushes and carry it off to build its nest. In that moment, Maggie knew what to do. And we'll find out what Maggie did with her treasure on a true cliffhanger. If you, what a uh, if you find this wherever you like to buy books, ideally at your local bookstore. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you. Oh. Oh. So tell me, um, I'm just curious, um, what are some of your treasures? Oh, my personal treasures or the treasures that find their way into my house? <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my personal treasures, I would say, especially as a kid, were things like uh, anytime I could find like an animal bone or, you know, pine cones, stones, shells, looking for sea glass. You know, I was, I was very lucky as a child to be uh, taken on many outings um, in nature. And so that was always something. If you went out, you had to come back with something to yeah. show where you'd been. So was that in Stratford, if you don't mind me asking? Or, well, so or yeah, I, grew, I was born in London, Ontario. Uh, and then I moved to a much smaller town called Mitchell, Ontario. Then we made our way I to Strat. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's where I spent the bulk of my childhood and uh, moved it's to Stratford beautiful. later in life. Yeah, it's really nice. There was a, a beautiful river that ran uh, through the town. And that's where I sort of like to explore a lot. But we would often go to conservation areas and, and you know, beaches, Lake Huron, that type of thing. And I just always loved finding what I could. And then my daughters actually inspired this book. Um, yeah, so that was obviously going to be one of my questions. I was curious. I'm always curious as to where do you get these ideas? This is a very yeah. interesting idea. Yes, yeah, so this this came from uh, our daughters. So we have three daughters, Maya, Amelia, and Ella. They're, they're nine, six, and three. Wow. And a few years ago when the idea came to me, they were all obsessed with finding treasure you know, on walks in our neighborhood in Guelph at the time where we lived. And so their coat pockets would be just packed with plastic and sticks and stones and feathers. And, you know, each item that they found was absolutely precious to them and completely coveted. And, you know, we tried to, to sort of foster that imagination and creativity. And so what ended up happening is parents is all of a sudden their bedside tables are just spilling out with junk right and I mean, they're, they're <laughs> listening to me now so I it's not junk I know it's treasure but uh, <laughs> so I thought it's interesting to play with the idea of the tension between a child and the way they see the world it's full of wonder and curiosity and magic but that the rest of us kind of put limits on that and eventually I thought what would you do if it just this kid started bringing home canoes and barbecues and like, you know, anything she saw became treasure. So that's where I, that's where I got the idea. Yeah. And it's, it's also about, you know, being resourceful and doing, doing something quite remarkable with what you have. I, I certainly remember that too. Like uh, I grew up in Burlington and there was a lot of, um, a lot more um, nature around at that time. And so you mm -hmm. would go to the Creek and, bring home, like you say, stones, sticks, yeah. pieces of glass. I, the obsession that I remember as a child is because we spent some time in Muskoka was the little round, little round stones mm. that my sister and I would paint. And we oh, made a whole yeah. ton of stones that looked like ladybugs. Oh, great. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I've noticed that around too lately with, you know, with lockdown, people are getting we're getting creative in their communities. And we've noticed all these little stones being painted and left in neighborhoods in Stratford yeah. where we live now. And it's kind of bringing a bit of magic back to the streets, which is nice. Yeah, it's yeah. heartening. And to, but also like you say, to see the beauty in something and mm -hmm. the usefulness in something that you wouldn't necessarily consider at first. Yes. And, yes. Yeah. And, and, and to a child, what they have, it means so much to them. Absolutely. Yeah. And I wanted to also to, to dive into that around, there's also something around the creative process too, right? Like if you just compile and, and sort of build up all these ideas in your head and don't share them with the, the world around you, it can become a bit cluttered in your brain. And, and, and so um, I wanted to, to play with the idea of, well, once she realizes that she can make things out of all these disparate objects and share it with her community, spoiler alert. <laughs> um, <laughs> that she can really find value. Really, yeah. 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 And and then, you know, like, cause kids, 
love that sort of stuff. And it, it's also um, makes acknowledges that, yeah, like this stuff is important to me and it's, in, and it's important to her and, and you should value that. Yes. Absolutely. So speaking of treasures, do you have any other story treasures coming your way in the near future? Stories. Oh, like things uh, on the, on the horizon. On the horizon. Yes, I do. So I'm um, really excited for next year, uh, a book coming out called song for the snow with groundwood books <gasps> and illustrated by Byron Eggensweiler. Um, wow. And it's, it's uh, yeah, really, really excited about that one. It's uh, about a, a young girl who uh, loves the snow um, and the snow has played a big role in her, in her community, but it hasn't come to her town in, in a few years. And so she tries to, to call the snow home with the, with the you know, assistance of a bit of magic. So um, really excited about that one as well. Sounds like you like to put magic into your stories. I do. I love uh, Tokyo Digs a Garden was, was the, first, the first story. And um, I feel that adding magical sort of elements to real world situations is really interesting. I always love those books of magical realism. And, and so it's, it always just is fun to stretch the imagination. Um, I'm curious, is there, is there, um, do you, why is it that you wanted to get into say picture book writing? Is there, is there a way that you can, like, I know why I fell yeah. into picture book. I'm always curious as to why writers, you know, go into this path. For me, it happened a little bit by accident. So I had the story of Tokyo Digs a Garden in, uh, in my head for about 10 years, and I didn't quite know the format. I just knew the story. And I thought it could be a short story. I mean, it's obviously a, bit, a child story, but I, I hadn't really considered myself to be an author of any kind, let alone children's books. And my brother-in-law, Kellen Hatanaka, who's an illustrator, had done a oh, few books. That. Yeah, and he sort of, he and I, he was wanting to do a more story-driven piece. And I said, well, I have this idea. And it ended up coming to fruition. And then that was sort of my very lucky entry point. And once that happened, um, I just fell in love with the format. I mean, the beautiful thing about picture books to me is there's like a dance between words and images. So you write the text and you have an image kind of in your head as you're writing it. Then you hand it off to the illustrator and they do so much. They bring the story exactly. completely to life. To the level. And, and so, uh, yeah. it's, it's, like it's, an, it's like a tapestry. That's right. And there's so much you can say without words in a picture book, which is um, something I'm learning as I as I go. So my tendency is just to write very descriptively. And the editors are like, well, pull it back a bit. <laughs> let the let the illustrator do their job too. So um, it's it's and one of my favorite things is when I'm reading with my my children every night, when a an author puts a pause in right? Where there's that empty space where you can just soak in the image that you're looking at. And I think um, it's such a beautiful um, uh, format, I think. And, and there's, there's no limitations. That's right. And you, you can, can do anything. <laughs> Your kids must be really excited. That they're you so write. great. Yeah, they're, they're awesome. And they, you know, they, um, it was very exciting. The, the best thing for me is always reading it to them for the first time. They've sort of heard the story over and over because I self-edit with them, you know, while I'm working on a manuscript. I'll so are, they, are they sort of like little editors in a way? Oh, in a big way. Yeah, they're my first round editors and they will um, they will slice and dice stories pretty quickly <laughs> if I see them and it, and, losing and interest. And they're probably brutally honest. Oh, yeah. Which is always <laughs> appreciated. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, you're talking about treasures and I did mention that, oh, the background is so neat and clean, but mm -hmm. would normally lots of treasures be all around your home? Yeah. So what we've done is there's like, we just pushed it all into the kitchen. So <laughs> our, um, there's not many spaces here that aren't infiltrated by the, the various bits and pieces of our, our daughters, <laughs> the growing collection of things that glitter. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's very inspiring. Um, so. Tell me, um, what sort of treasures do you like to collect now? Oh gosh, now I think I collect a lot of ideas. I think as treasure. Ideas so ideas are treasures. Yeah. It's true. And when I'm you not, have an idea, that's right. You've got to write it down. 
you've got to. So I'm currently haunted by a few of them that keep me up at night <laughs> in a good way. Um, but I'm not much of a collector otherwise. Like I don't, I don't uh, have sort of collecting hobbies or anything like that. Aside from you know good food and <laughs> groceries, I'm I'm collecting plants right now. I'll say that. Like I we we're really been focusing on our garden, and I've been, you know, my treasures are actually like perennials and you know new seeds that we can find and plant in our in our backyard and see what happens. So, isn't that lovely? Yeah, I I used to also collect a lot of uh, treasures and but I find that because we're, we're in a house that's quite large for just two people and mm -hmm. it's amazing how stuff starts to uh, pile okay. up and yes. then you have to let those treasures go yes. to perhaps give room for new treasures that's right that's right and it's the other theme in the book of course is just the culture that we have of consumption and stuff and that you know yeah. in, in underlying you know that maggie's neighborhood is just full of stuff that she can collect and you know if you were to just put a lot of the things that we find on the street into one house you could see how quickly it would it would take over and so there was that idea of well if you you can still make use of a lot of this stuff that we throw away and and um you know, it's a much bigger problem than any child can handle at one, on her own, of course. But, um, yeah. But it's nice also to communicate the, the beauty in, in things that perhaps we don't necessarily think are that, that beautiful. Absolutely. Well, I mean, as soon as I was reading the story, this one phrase popped into my head that I remember hearing as a kid, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Yes, absolutely. And it's so true with kids. You can see that. Like, if... If you throw away that ribbon that they found because you didn't realize like, oh what it God. meant, it's my a, ribbon. That's, that's so right. important to me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and it's it's interesting because as a child you do you get attached to sometimes odd things, but they mean everything to you yes. because of your world is small. That's right. Yeah, and I think we could all do a lot to learn from that. In fact, being, yes, being happy yeah. with what you have. Yeah, and making good use of what you have. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, other than that, any other stories coming your way, or is there is? Yeah, there's another one that's I. I don't think we've made the announcement yet, but it's another one that uh, is with Groundwood, and that's coming out the year after next. And uh, really that. excited about the illustrator on that one as well. Um, and uh, it is about a boy in a river. I'll say that. So it, it it's hearkening back to my my childhood. childhood again. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Well, all the best. Thank and you. And I look forward to more stories. Um, is there anything else that you would like to uh, say to our wonderful uh, audience? Just a big shout out to everybody for joining. And it's uh, it's great to be able to be here virtually, you know, in the midst of yeah. the fact that we can't do it. So I'm just so happy that the festival that we made this happen. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, exciting it's and wonderful. great to connect with you as well. Thank you. And all the best. And don't forget... John Eric Lapano, Maggie's Treasure. Thank you. <laughs> Published by? Groundwood Books. Groundwood Books. Yeah. Have Thank a great you. day. Thanks so Thanks much. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, that was wonderful. And now the next story is called Salma, the Syrian Chef by Danny Ramadan. Danny Ramadan is a Syrian-Canadian author an award-winning activist and public speaker. Ooh. His debut novel, The Clothesline Swing, won multiple awards. He works in activism, provided, provided a safe passage to dozens of Syrian LGBTQ refugees to Canada. He lives in Vancouver, British Columbia, with his husband. Welcome, Danny Ramadan. Thank you, thank you for hosting me. Hi, Patricia. Hi, oh my God, I love your shirt. <laughs> Thank you. It's, I'm really into um, flowers, and actually. that is so gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> my husband has a little flower garden on our balcony as well, so I'm surrounded by flowers all the time. <laughs> Delightful. And I just love how I'm able to talk to people from all different parts of the world. This is the, the beautiful benefit of the streamline. I mean, I wish I didn't wake up at seven o'clock in the morning for this, well, but here I, we are. <laughs> sorry, I forgot about that. <laughs> well, you look very wide awake for having to get up so early. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, so am I into reading? Is the best part of the story or? 
Sure, yeah. So Salma Syrian Chef is a, no um, a novel, a picture book that I um, worked with um, Anik Press on creating. The folks at Anik Press were quite generous with their time, with their support, so I can create this book. Uh, it focuses on the story of Salma, who came with her mother from Syria here to uh, Vancouver. And her mother is overwhelmed with work, with, with le learning the language, finding home, finding a sense of belonging, that she, she needs a bit of a cheer up. So Salma cooks her a Syrian meal to make her feel a bit more like she's home. Um, the illustrations are by Anna Braun. Uh, here we go, Anna Braun. And yes, they, thank you. Um, we work together on the including some Syrian um, uh, mosaic uh, drawings into the book just to make sure that we are representing the culture the best we can. Would you All like right. to the story? Sorry, yeah, yeah. Salma the Syrian chef. Selma watches the Vancouver rain from her apartment window in the Welcome Center. It's different than the sunny days back in Syria. She still can't pronounce Vancouver, but her friends tell her that her ways of saying it are way more fun. <laughs> Vancouver, Selma says to Mama, but Mama is making dinner. Van Durer, <laughs> Selma rolls her R's. But Mama won't look up from her English homework. Vancouver! Selma finally succeeds. But Mama is busy calling Baba back in Syria. Aww. Baba will join them in Canada soon. Selma's heart aches like a tiny fire in her chest when she thinks of Baba. She wonders if Mama's heart is burning too. Mama used to giggle with her friends in the refugee camp. It sounds like the ringing bells of the older boys' bikes. Now, after a long day of job interviews and English classes, Mama barely smiles when tucking Salma in. Sad, yeah? Maybe if Salma can make Mama laugh, Vancouver will feel a little more like home. Salma draws Mama a clown balancing on a ball on top of an elephant. She tells Mama a knock-knock joke about bananas and oranges that she learned in language school. She even hides behind the fridge. She jumps out and screams, boo! <laughs> but all she gets is Mama's sad smile, full of love, but empty of joy. Oh. Amen. I want to make Mama laugh. Salma rushes into the playroom and almost crashes into Nancy's chair. She's been sad for a long time. When was the last time you saw Mama happy? Asks Nancy in her broken Arabic. Salma imagines a waterfall of Mama's many sad faces since they left Syria. How about you draw a picture? Nancy says, drawing helps me whenever I forget my good memories. Selma looks at the colorful crayons. Her memories of Mama's smile shine like a beautiful rainbow over that waterfall. So descriptive. Um, I, I love my metaphors. <laughs> I know, I was, I was saying that to my husband. I was like, oh, that's just such beautiful metaphors. Oh, thank you, appreciate it. Um, Selma draws her home back in Damascus, a yellow house with a garden surrounded it like a necklace. The garden had a tree with green leaves and a bird's nest with three little eggs. She colors the living room walls purple. Were the walls really purple? Nancy asks. No, Selma says, but it's okay to add colors to my own memories. I agree. <laughs> she draws Baba at the table Mama carrying a freshly made dish of full shami, a big smile on her face. Salma can't bring Baba here sooner. She can't rebuild their own home, but suddenly she knows what to do. I'm gonna read a couple more pages and then just to make sure that we are on time. 
Yeah. <laughs> I you're think good, Mama. You're, you're good. You've got time. Awesome. I think Mama misses Syrian food. Sama tells Nancy and the other kids, I want to make her full shammy. I miss kushari, Ayman says. Salma tastes the salty, spicy Egyptian dish on her tongue. I miss the way my mama made masala dosa back in India, Raya adds. Ivan misses Arribas. He just arrived from Venezuela. But none of them have ever heard of full shami, and Salma doesn't know how to make it. This is one of my favorite. Uh, pages to be honest just the children talking about their favorite foods it's just so I love cute that. it's, it's yeah. universal language i know right <laughs> like music exactly mm -hmm. uh do you know how to make full shami Salma asked jad the jordanian translator who taught her all the english names of the flowers in the community garden mm -hmm. no but i can find a recipe for you Jad says his fingers move swiftly on his keyboard. Then Salma hears the printer ticking. Jad hands Salma a paper with Arabic words. I can do this, she whispers. Then she realizes she doesn't know the English names of any of the vegetables. Oh. <laughs> I know. There we go. Salma reads the Arabic words. She is scared of looking silly in this new place where hardly anyone knows her, her language. The smell of crayons on her fingers remind her, I can throw the vegetables. Yellow for lemon, green for parsley, brown for bees, and red for onions, she sings. And this is chickpeas, and that is garlic, and that's a bottle of olive oil. Soon, she has all the drawings she needs. Very resourceful. I know, right? So many different ways that you can communicate without actually having a common language. Aisha walks Salma to the supermarket so she doesn't have to cross the street alone. Salma likes Aisha. They play hop squash in the welcome center, and Aisha brought her home baked Somalian sweets. Shukran. Salma thanks Aisha as they wait for the traffic to stop. I just want to say, can you bring that closer to the camera, that page? That is one of my favorite spreads. I oh. looked at that and I thought I was going to cry. It's so beautiful. It's it's one of my favorite too. She I worked got, really hard, yeah. I could, felt like I could feel the rain, the way she drew it. <laughs> True, it, it feels very representative of Vancouver. And to be honest, like there is a street in Vancouver that look exactly the same way. So I'm assuming that Anna just like, grabbed a chair and sat there and just like drew the thing. It's, it's beautiful, just beautiful. Hmm. Uh, this is actually my favorite. I'll tell you why in a sec. Back at the Welcome Center, Salma organizes her vegetables on the kitchen table. My mama won't be laughing at all if I use the knife, Salma tells Amir and Malik, who came together from Lebanon. Can you help me chop those vegetables? She blushes when Malik kisses away Amir's onion tears. The three of them giggle until Salma realizes she forgot the spices. Mama likes sumak in her full shami. So this is my favorite, personally. Well, they look a, like they're having a good time. They're having a fantastic time, that's true. But the other thing is here. Oh, here we go. Um, the, the illustrator, Anna Braun, Mm -hmm. has uh, a Syrian friend who also identifies queer. And he looks, where is it? He looks like this. Aww. And this person looks like me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's wonderful when you can personalize it and you're like, I'm in a book. <laughs> I'm in a book, look at me. <laughs> I'll have to go back and look at those pictures again. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> All right, one more page and then we call it. Um, so Selma looks through the spices rack. Paprika is Baba's favorite spice, and Mama loves cardamom in her coffee. Pepper makes her sneeze, but she can't find some mac. Tears fill her eyes. This is the worst idea ever. It is too hard to cook Syrian food here. San Sanma's fingers shake. The spices get blurry, and their smells mix together. 
everything is ruined, Salma says between her teeth. I'll never make mama laugh. I love that page with all of the spices. I and know, it's fantastic. Page. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. I think, how about we, like I've been reading sure. for 10 minutes, we'll yeah. give some yeah. space. There's a lot um, that I'd like to ask about the book. First of all, is there, is Salma like a, an amalgamation of the children that you have come across? Or is there a real, I'm just curious, is there a real Salma? I, I have to ask, because she seems sure. so real. Um, so to be honest, when I wrote the book, I had a picture of my niece uh, oh. as as the, the character. Um, I've never met my niece in my life. Like she was born after I left Syria and she lives with her mother in, in, in uh, Jordan at the moment with my sister in Jordan. Um, we're working on sponsoring them to come here to Canada, but with COVID-19, they were supposed to actually be arriving, but with oh, COVID-19. Yeah, so we will, we're just waiting and hoping for the best. Um, but yeah, like I had this, this resourceful, resilient, um, life-loving character right there in front of me. And I'm like, I want to write you, you know? And she is, she's, she's, she's got lovely. She's so much spirit. You know, she, she does. Is. And, and as because she just seemed like she, this was a real person, you know, because she had so many emotions and feelings. She wasn't, you know, two dimensional. She was, she's so rich. Mm, I appreciate you saying that. It's, um, it's also the work between, to be honest, it's the work that we did, me and Claire at Anik Press, because um, I, I, I wrote the first draft like overnight one day, like one day I kept struggling with how to write this book. And then I cooked a Syrian meal for my my friends and my husband here. And then, and it was a freaking adventure. Like I had to go <laughs> around and find the spices and find the right things. And where's the baba beans? And it, it was a whole adventure. So I was like, that's actually a perfect uh, metaphor for the struggles that newcomers find trying to stay with their identities, but also trying to into, integrate into their new homes. Um, so I wrote the first draft and then Claire kept coming back to me being like, I want her to be self-sufficient. I want this little girl to be so um, resilient and, 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 and loving and like, yes, let's show the challenges, but also let's show her uh, rising over all of those challenges. Problem solving, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, and it's just like, it just, it's just so much heart in this story. And as I say, I love your metaphors. I would, I, I, I say to my husband, listen to this one. Oh, it's just so lovely. Oh. And um, I also, and, and then the illustrations just capture, I mean, I've been to Vancouver, it's been quite a while, but it captures that feeling of Vancouver. And what mm -hmm. I loved about the illustrations, I'm, because I'm artistic, I, I just love that she used different colors for, for outside that you wouldn't necessarily normally see, like purple skies, purple mountains, purple water, pink mm -hmm. trees. And mm -hmm. uh, it's it's just so lush. I mean, it is it is like a meal, this book. And I'm actually, oh. I got quite hungry reading this. So <laughs> well, it's, it's honestly, it has been, um, I'm getting a lot of positive reviews of the book, which is something that is, that I'm, I'm really valuing. Um, and I think the reason why it's coming across so positively is because I wrote it very authentically. I tried my very best. I went through the refugee experience. I came here to 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 Canada in two thousand and fourteen. Yeah, I, that was going to be like one of my questions. Like, where where is all this coming from? <clears throat> yeah. So it, it I went. Felt so yeah. real. And that's that's the idea. Like it's 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 focused on that authentic experience of a refugee coming here. And yes, like you want to embrace the society. You want to welcome to be to be in a new home and and feel this this sense of belonging but it doesn't come like this no. it's not something that is instant you don't build the home in a day so mm -hmm. so i wanted to represent that i wanted to represent that yes there is there is a drive by newcomers and refugees to integrate into the society but also there is a pull of them wanting to be part of their own identity as well yeah and so i'm curious because i have never heard a fool Full chamois. Yes, full chamois. So I don't really know. I'm, what is what is it? Full chamois is means literally vava beans from Damascus. 
Shami is the oh. Messian, means literally the Messian, because we call Damascus uh -huh. Shem. In, in, in Arabic, we call Damascus Shem. Um, so yeah, it's it's a um, it's a meal that we have every Friday morning. Usually, it's um, um, it's a breakfast item. It's more of a warm salad of sorts. So you have you heat up the vava beans, you heat up the chickpeas, you mix them together. You add some tomatoes, some parsley, some garlic, um, lots of spices, olive oil, lemon sometimes, and you you mix them together. I'm, I'm like my mouth is watering just talking about it. It sounds delicious. Now it I know really I have good. eaten canna masala. I yes. I've had that. Is that also is that a Syrian food as well? No, masala is, is I think masala is Indian, I think, I believe. Right, right. Yeah. And um so are you are you a great chef then? Am I to assume that you're a good cook? <laughs> um only if I want to poison people. Uh, <laughs> no, um, <laughs> no, I I I'm a great Syrian chef, but uh and not so much other other cuisines to be honest. Uh the challenge however with Syrian food is that it's it's a uh, it's an undertaking. It's a lot to cook a Syrian meal because okay. yeah, because our our food is complex. There are so many different flavors. It's very subtle. Um, there's a lot of vegetarian and vegan options in our cuisine. So we we mix spices, we pickle things, and and all of those things come together to create a meal that might take three or four hours to 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 create. And and then I it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's gone in like ten minutes, and I I, I don't Just have. Like that. <laughs> I mean, it's yummy, it's delicious, but you have to do what you have to do. Yeah. Well, yeah. what I love about all of um, the authors that I'm speaking to today is that they're all you know different cultures, but and that you know communic it's all about communication and language, different languages, mm. the language yeah. of food. Um, just the language of physical movement, um, that even if you can't speak the words, there is always a way to get your message across. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, this is mm -hmm. such a lovely story and beautiful art. And um, our time is almost up. Is All there right. a sto another story that's coming soon in the future? Um, not a children's book. Um, Anik Press and I, we are talking about different children's books, so maybe. But um, I'm working on my novel, my next novel, The Foghorn Echoes, which um, hopefully you'll see in the next year or so. And I'm working on a collection of short stories. So also, hopefully, you'll see that soon. Keeping very busy. I well, it's keep a beautiful myself story. busy. Thank you. And uh, I lovely language, beautiful art. Congratulations. Yes. So Salma, The Syrian Chef by Danny Ramadan and published by... And express. And it, yeah. Get out there and get that copy. Thank you very much. I hope it's a beautiful day um, in uh, Vancouver. Looks like Take it. Take care. <laughs> oh, it bye. does. Okay. Bye bye. Oh, that was really interesting. And now we are going to be talking to Nadia L. Hong and her book, Little Miss Lou. Now, there's a lot to say about Nadia. She has managed to achieve quite a few things in her life. <laughs> Nadia Elhan is a dynamic story lady who is presented to audiences in Canada, United States, United Kingdom, United Arab Emirates, Jamaica, and Trinidad. Her first two books, Music and Media in the Sankofa series, were published by Rubicon Publishing in 2015, but she's done a lot since then. Her award-winning first picture book, Malika's Caution was published in 2016, Malika's Winter Carnival 2017, Malika's Surprise in 2021 by Groundwood Books. Nadia is also the author of Harriet Tubman, Freedom Fighter, an early reader by Harper Collins. I gotta take a breath. <gasps> published in December 2018, A Little Miss Lou, How Jamaican Poet Louise Bennett Coverley Found Her Voice, nonfiction picture book about the performer, playwright, author, and Jamaican cultural ambassador. Louise Bennett Coverley, otherwise known as Miss Lou. She's such a joyous person. Look at that face. <laughs> it was published in 2019 by All Kids. Nadia was one of six Black Canadian writers to watch in 2018 by CBC Books. I'm exhausted. 
Oh my goodness. Welcome, <laughs> Nadia. <laughs> you. So good to see you, Patricia. Good to see you. Can you can you, the sound is a little bit um is there any way that you can uh raise the Oh or I just know. speak louder. You know what? I might just need to put my headphones in. Maybe that will help. I think so. Okay. Because I'm not quite Okay, let's see if this helps. Awesome. Better, better, better. I can hear better? you now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> but speak louder because it's still not quite. Do you hear me now? Awesome. Yes. Okay, perfect. Really awesome. That's it. Yeah. Well, welcome, Nadia. It's Thank been an you. amazing morning. Yeah. Such great stories. Yeah, so, so I think this is the second time I've been after Danny Ramadan in a festival. So this is awesome. When oh, they will so meet. Nice. When they will meet. <laughs> Let's hope so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, are you going to uh, talk about your book? Or are you going to read the book? Tell me, what uh, what are you going to uh, give to us today, this morning? Well, I wanted to just say good morning to everybody. And um, I just, I'm so excited to share Miss Lou with you. So I'm going to start off with a song. And then I'll Ooh. do a little reading. And then if you want to ask me questions after, it's all Certainly. like... I'm 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 flexible. So, <laughs> all right, and so we're gonna learn a little bit about Miss Lou today. Some of you may have heard of her. Um, I love. I will never stop talking about Miss Lou, because uh, she took the Jamaican folk uh, spoken language patois and brought it into a public sphere. She was probably one of the, the first persons to do that, and um, she's amazing. So here we go. Let me just check my two. And you know what? I think Patricia, you're you're a musician too. I don't know if you have your ukulele. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to just leave the music to you this morning. It's not about me. It's all about you. <laughs> this long time, yeah, me never see you. Come make me hold your hand. Your hand. Good. This long time, time girl, I never see, see you. Come back and hold ya. Peel her trunk or sit up a tree top. Pick up the blossom. The blossom. Make me hold your hand, girl. Make me hold make your hand. Yeah. Love that wow. song. And that is a song I love to open with because Miss Lou, she loved um, people. She loved kids and she would often start with that and if miss lou were alive today she would have been 101 years old whoa so, yeah so i wrote this book um i wanted this book to be published for her 100th anniversary and it was just in time so i'm going to share a little bit about how miss lou became the miss lou we have come to know and love so it's called A Little Miss Lou, How Jamaican Poet Louise Bennett Coverley Found Her Voice. Louise Bennett love words. She play with them. Let's make sure you can see the pictures. <laughs> she played with them. She ate them up for breakfast, served with roasted breadfruit, ackee, and saltfish. She swallowed each word whole. When it came to speaking, Louise's words got stuck in our throat, but she found a way to unlock them. Her pen was the key and her notebook, the door. I love that. I love gobbling words. <laughs> All the food. words she like, many, words many words. Food. Yes, lots of food words in there. At school, Louise's teacher thought that words had to click like clacking wheels. And that sentences should sound, should line up like the tram car tracks in Kingston. Louise got good grades, but she wanted more. Each day, she passed the men working on the Kingston street, weary and glistening in broiling heat. They heaved and huffed filling the sides of the dirt road in a rhythm. Hilangoli rider, Hilangoli, Hilangoli rider, Hilangoli, and a bend on loading a Hilangoli, and a bend on a loading a Hilangoli, and there's butter nuts at tumble down a Hilangoli. Do you know that song? No, but I just love the sound of it. Hilangoli rider, and you say Hilangoli. Hilangoli. Good. Hilangoli rider, Hilangoli, and I bend on Ludanga. 
Elangali. And that's better than that's a trouble, Danga. Elangali. All right. You got it. You got it. So she'd hear songs like that in the streets. And then when she got home at school, Louise tried to find the bendong ludong of the men's shovels. She wanted to hear their songs on the paper, the bass in her pen, the drum from their words. Louise was lost in her thoughts, wondering what voice should she listen to? The one with words that lined up like the schoolgirls in starch uniforms or the other voice? Louise Bennett, you need to be writing. One day, Louise got on a crowded tram car to go to the picture show. She saw a little space at the back between some market women holding their wares. Spread out yourself, Deliza, one woman warned the other. Dress so man I come. Like Dr. Bird's wings. Just like that little bird, like Dr. Bird's wings. The words tickle Louise's ears and like peanut drops, they stuck. Oh, and that can you hold me for one minute, please? I'm sorry, guy. Guy, <laughs> sorry, my <laughs> husband is playing noise, and I oh, that I'm hosting. Uh oh, okay, my apologies. <laughs> okay, no worries. Real life steeps in, it steeps in, it always steeps in. So, I'm gonna stop right there with my book. That was actually a perfect segue because that is <laughs> that moment. That mm. happened, that's based on a true story. That moment had a, a impact on Miss Lou in her life. So if you want to find out what happened, you got to oh, get a copy of the story. Another tease. Wow. <laughs> we have yeah. a fair amount of time yeah. um, to, to talk about. Like, I'm, there's so many things I want to ask. Like, um, had you... Had you wanted to, you wanted to write a story about uh, Miss Lou for a long time? For a long time. This book took me seven years to write. Wow. Yeah. To so write. Why, would, why, why seven years? Just because you wanted to get the words right, the information right? To... Oh, yeah, it was a lot of that. It was, uh, I was pre-published um, when I started this book. I was working on it in a, uh, in a writing class, uh, nonfiction for children taught by Kathy Rendina. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I started it there. It was an idea. It was a dream, but I, I was pre-published. So the idea of getting published was pretty daunting for me. I was also teaching and I, I'm a teacher. So it, I had a lot of things juggling and I was working right. on other stories too. Um, but that was just part of it. The other part is there isn't a whole lot of information about the biograph biography of Miss Lou's early life. Um, there is only one other book that I... I know of that is published about her life and that meant I had to do a lot of research. So, talk yes, I'm sure. so how would you get that information? Did right. you actually go to Jamaica? Okay. So I was hoping to do some research in Jamaica and unfortunately that summer, cause there is a Miss Lou, there's a Louise Bennett archives at the national library in Kingston. I was supposed to go there and I had to change plans. My, I had a, um, death in the family so i basically changed plans i didn't get to go but there is a second archives it's actually at mcmaster university oh, and i, I spent three really? days there yes so I, exactly so i was like you know i was googling um i sang in a folk choir caribbean folk choir called the heritage singers i uh, just so happened that and i didn't know this but i went on the hair um I, t I know a few people in the community, spoke to them, somehow found this archive, went to the website, and in the picture I see somebody who I recognize. And it turned out to be somebody who used to do tech for us, for the choir. And that turns out to be Miss Lou's son. His name is Fabian Coverly. So small Whoa. world. So I was like, you wow. You can't get closer to <laughs> Miss Lou than that. Yeah. And this choir I sang in used to sing with Miss Lou when she lived in Canada. And they performed. I didn't know she lived in Canada. She lived in Canada for the last 20 years of her life. Where did she live? Scarborough. I yeah. Had no, I, had I, had no no, I had no clue either. So she passed away in 2006. And I would have, if I had and you known, could have met her. I could have met her so oh, many times. Oh my goodness. So she's, we had this national, international um, icon living in Scarborough <laughs> and had no idea that this person was there. So That's I, crazy. 
Hey. Yeah. So she's and she's lived in many places. She lived in England. She lived in Brooklyn. She lived in Jamaica. And then she spent her last 20 years here. What a fascinating lady. She was. She was. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you want to see my Miss Lou doll? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. Hey, it's sharing is caring. So I was so I saw this, I saw this doll in the archive. And when I went, I actually went to Miss Lou's, um, they unveiled a square and a statue in her honor for her 100th anniversary last year. So I was in Jamaica last year. And there was this woman walking around with these dolls, three different oh. sizes. Three, Whoa! Yeah. So I was like, I, I need that. And apparently she talks. Does she have the print? Yeah, she, she talks. She talks. I haven't figured out how to make her talk yet. Is there nothing in the back of her neck or anything like that? It says press my left side, but um, I haven't heard her talk yet. I think that, <laughs> that might freak me out. Maybe. Well, maybe she's got wait until there's <laughs> got really something important to say. Now, are those one of those Jamaican dolls that have all the different um, uh, layers underneath her skirt? Oh, that flip. Oh, hold on. You oh. know what I mean? Yeah. Because I, I remember so. I like had a crinoline. She has a yeah, crinoline. Yeah, I had to make dolls when I was young. And so that's what I remember as well. That yeah. is incredible. That's gorgeous. She's big. Yeah. And I and I'm telling you, like, I got this doll. I was like, um, it was like four thirty-six US dollars for this. I was like, you know what? That's that's a pretty good for this doll. And they had a larger one and a smaller one. And I just like I'm so glad that I had this. So it, it comes with me sometimes when I do school visits, but it stays with me. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I, I would imagine, I bet the kids really want to. Yes, the kids would probably want to. <laughs> because <laughs> she's so, like, huggable and she's sweet. She's very huggable and sweet. I actually keep her in a box because I'm, I'm just so protective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whatever works, Nadia. Yeah. yeah. So, so, what, a, what a lovely story. And um, so... For those wondering, like the reason why I can sometimes communicate quite well with Nadia is because um, my mother is from Jamaica. I, I I was not immersed in this culture the way you were. I grew up, you know, your basic. You know what? Regular kid. I wasn't immersed in it either. I I sought it out, but you. But I'm going to interrupt your story. I want to hear your story. Well, just just that I grew up in Burlington. You know, yeah. in a very how should I say? Um, Monocultural. Thank you. Um, <laughs> word. Uh, there weren't very many um, different cultures back then. And if yeah. there were, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but if there were, you you didn't want to share it because it Aww. meant different. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was an observer and I, I saw how certain kids who were different were treated differently. Mm -hmm. And I, I, so for that very reason, I kept that information about myself you quite, know quite a while you know what i'm actually just started my mfa in creative writing and we spent we read so many there's so that's a very common experience like a lot of writers felt that way especially writers who were different and, and wondering about sharing that difference or when to feel that the space was safe to do so so you are experiencing what a lot of writers feel and i think that's very human um yeah. And I think for me, it was like, um, I actually discovered there's this book. I'm going to show you the cover of this book. You're getting real excited there. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, this book. This is how I found out about Miss Lou. So I was a kid. I liked to go to the library and my dad would take me and my sister. And I was always looking for books that had kids that looked like me. And then I see this book. What, mango Spice. Mango Spice, 44 Caribbean songs. Oh. And this book was published in England in the, I think, 80s or 70s. And that's where I saw Louise Bennett's name for the very first time. So she, a lot of the songs she um, found were traditional folk songs. This, song, this book came with a tape and it had like recordings. So my sister and I just listened to it over and over and over and over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> and, it. and that's that's how I got to know these songs too. But you knew the first one I sang. Yeah, I did. And, yeah. And um, so my memory's a bit hazy, but so I I knew about Harry Belafonte. Yes. So that that was the the one Jamaican musician, and he's he's actually you know from the states. But he's Jamaican too. He's, he's Jamaican. yeah yeah. 
But he he sort of he he so he sang a lot of these folk songs. He did. He brought them to you know mainstream. Yeah. And the reason I I know about that is because my mother could sing and play the guitar, and she would sing oh. that song. That's one of the folk songs she would oh. sing. That's amazing. So, you know, um, come let me hold your hand. And I can't remember. Yes. De -de 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 pick up the blossom. Yes. Yes. Let me hold your hand, girl. Let me hold your hand. Yes. And I, for whatever reason, I've always loved music and I love yes. words. And all of those songs that he sung, they were so, they were so beautiful and funny. Yeah. Also, like, kids, we loved Mama Look a Boo Boo. Okay. <laughs> And you know what? They were friends. Like um, Harry Belafonte, a lot of the songs that he sang, those those Calypso, they called it Calypso. It's actually Mento. Those were songs that um, Louise Bennett collected. Because one of the jobs Louise had, she was actually commissioned by the government um, to actually go and collect songs. And she was working throughout the country um, as a drama educator. Um, she's quite an amazing person. So she was doing theater and she collected a lot of these songs, which we know because of um, thanks to Harry Belafonte. But that's the kind of thing that I want people to know that because of Miss Lou, we know of Harry Belafonte. Bob Marley would have grown up hearing these songs. Um, and it's quite remarkable that a woman born in 1919, a black woman, a woman born in the Caribbean, which at the time, Jamaica was a colony. So yeah. there's so many things that like you think, oh, wow, she she was quite an interesting renaissance. Innovator. Yeah. Very and, different. She, and she had some famous friends. She had some really famous friends. I don't doubt it. I mean, she's <laughs> an incredible person. Mm -hmm. So and it's like you're carrying on. Yes. <laughs> spirit of... Uh, Miss Lou. Yeah. And I, I knew about Miss Lou because I remember every now I would hear my mother talk about it a little bit, but I didn't oh. know the details of it. Like I would hear these bits and pieces of it. And, and you, um, did, you knew she's an author as well and a poet, right? She wrote books. Um, and yeah, I, I actually know one of her poems. Would you like me to say it for you? I would love to hear okay. it. It's called Education Stutteration by Louise Bennett Coverley. Me fill up my purse with money. Them teeth it were from me. Me fill up my belly with food. And <laughs> as me sneeze, me feel hungry. Me fill up my brain with learning, with sense and knowledge grand. Me feel relief. Not a thief can thief me education. Child, if you have ambition, no matter if you're poor, nothing can keep you down now. It's free schooling galore. Take one step, bram bram, into the best school in the land to qualify and to emboldify with education. Mas Joseph Tonfoot nephew, Jane Twistmouth girl Ritty, Rata Data, study for university. Them countenance no handsome, them station no grand, them clothes did wreck, but them brain can take an education. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Excellent. <laughs> thank you. And I also wanted did did want to comment as well as the art of the book. The oh, yes. Yes. They're, they're so it's rich. It's lush. It's almost like you could eat the book. It, it, it's so yummy. I don't know how else. Yeah. You know what? I've heard I've seen it in a review. They said creamy, creamy. And that's one way to describe it, I think. Right. And the funny thing is when I illustrated. Sorry, when I I didn't illustrate it. Sorry. I'll show you something I did illustrate. I know though. you do draw, though. Yeah, I do. I want to tell you something. When I wrote this book, I had no idea what the what the pictures would look like. like I was like, is this going to be color? I had no idea. So when um, we were thinking about the illustrator and my publisher suggested um, uh, Eugenie Fernandez, I said, sure, because I know her work. And I've as a teacher, as a kindergarten teacher, I've read books she's illustrated. But if you... Um, happen to like coloring um this is something that i illustrated so oh if you go to go to my website bring it up close i want to see sure Will you show me some of your art before that is so good yeah so if you want to go to my website nadia l h o h n dot com slash books look for a little miss lou you'll find this on the website i think it's under the teacher or the kids link to color and also, if you're an educator, or I guess some of the parents are supporting their stu uh, kids at home, um, this is actually a unit, a guide for teachers. Um, there's some lesson ideas, some excellent 
exercises to do with students. I actually wrote this and it's a great way to support this book as well. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Oh, I'm just, <laughs> today has been so amazing. Like each book is so different and yet there's that link of the similarity, like the, the lang about language and how the, yes. different, the language of food, the language of finding little beautiful objects, um, the unspoken language between a, a, a granddaughter and her grandfather. Communication comes in so many different ways. And then of course, the language of poetry and song mm -hmm. and words are like food. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and a lot of food, food words are in here. I have a question for you. Do you like to eat Jamaican beef patties? I haven't had one in a long time. Oh, okay. I like to eat the vegan ones. What Do you like spicy or mild? I would probably do mild because I have a very distinctive memory <laughs> of being in Jamaica for the first time and having, and they gave me a, a bona fide spice patty and it was so hot. I just remember running around freaking out. <laughs> oh. like, well, because growing yeah. up, we, we didn't have a lot of the Jamaican food. My my mother was more British, and yeah. so we would have more British type food. Although British, we all yeah. have rice and peas. Yes. Um, and I and I, and I've had salt fish with ackee. I think I can't is stand. That, is, oh, what's your favorite dish then? I love rice and peas, and okay, I love curry right. goat. And you like and curry goat? And plantain. But, plantain. I will. I I love plantain too. So we'll have to do some plantain. Uh, uh we got to maybe do a swap some time with uh well, i haven't cooked any of that food for a very long time okay. and i was never an expert at it oh, and i okay. always yeah. it always tastes better when somebody else makes it for you, you that's do really. true that's true <laughs> i i swear by my my cookbook so so uh, you got me there definitely <laughs> and so um uh are there other beautiful gems coming out in the future i i know you're a very busy productive uh, <laughs> well I have um, there's a so you mentioned uh, the Malaika series so I have two books in the series and uh, the third one comes out in spring so it's called Malaika Surprise that's the next book on my um, roster and I'm working on other stuff I've, I've pitched a few things to publishers and um, I have some stories in the works I'm also editing a, a novel manuscript that I am um, have been editing and working on for a long time so hopefully one day but I think the next absolutely next thing would be the um picture book yeah excellent now it is eleven twenty-two, and I'm I'm asking for a little assistance because I'm not entirely sure how long I can talk to you <laughs> I do realize there's something that's happening at 12 Ooh. So, Otherwise, I'm just going to keep talking to you. Yeah, um, no worries. I um, could, we could sing another song. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so sing me a song, please. Let's see. So this one, you might actually know it. It's um. So there are a couple songs that uh, Miss Lou would sing to say goodbye, and one of them was um. Oh gosh, oh I got I, now I can't remember it. Of course, it's called Mango. Um, Oh gosh, mango walk. But we'll do the. Oh, I know that one. Oh, you know. I learned that in school. Okay. Here we come. I show you how to do mango walk. Walk. Do mango walk. Do mango walk. Joey, come. I show you how to do mango walk. How to do the mango walk with me? Mango walk. Wow. I remember that. Oh my gosh, part. I can't remember. Okay, I don't play that one, but I can play. <laughs> I can... <laughs> I'm trying to play by ear. And I hope I'm like, are being no, entertained. I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that live, so that's not gonna happen. But I do. Um, play, um, let's see. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh anytime he member lies, I want to come on me. Every time I'm away from Liza, water come to me, I come back, Liza, come back, girl, wipe the tear from me, I come back, Liza, come back, girl, wipe the tear from me, I good. Anytime, remember, Miss Lou, water come to me, I. 
anytime in my mind. Pine Patricia, watch, watch it come to me. I are too sweet. Come back, Liza. Come back, girl. Watch what it come to me. I come, come back, back Liza. Come back, girl. Watch what come to me. I oh, watch you bring come back to me. I <laughs> I think we had a couple keys going there. Like <laughs> it was, it was a moment. It was a moment. That's right. That's right. So, yeah, so, Nadia, we're just going to keep talking until somebody, you know, tells me to be quiet because I'm so, is, not quite so who's, sure who's up next. Um, at twelve o'clock, according to what I've been given, we have a pre-recorded event from Summer Spectacular. Oh, I see. Hi there. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Sorry about that. That's okay. It's so lovely listening to all the songs. Did you talk to Nadia, or is there something that's, uh, are we going to have the pre recorded event now? Um, so the pre recorded event is going to start at 12. So okay. I'm just here to kind of wrap up everything until our little break, and then we're going to continue with the Ontario Science Center at 12. Excellent. Oh, yeah. I used to work there, actually. Really? Oh, I did. It was a he's fun got her fingers in many pines. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, first of all, sorry about the noise from my husband. He should know better. But I promise we heard happened. nothing. When it's yeah. live, we couldn't hear it. We Good. couldn't hear anything. Yeah, we wouldn't, yeah. none the wiser, to be honest. Awesome. Awesome. Because I could hear it. I was thinking, what are you doing? Don't you know what I'm doing? Right now? <laughs> That's yeah. okay. It happens. But yeah, so, Nadia, I just wanted to say uh, I actually discovered uh, Miss Lou earlier this year through your through your picture book, oh, and I just want to say I think there's a lot to learn for both adults and children through children's picture books. Like, yes. yeah, so much knowledge there. Thank you. If you go to the back of my book, there is like a afterward. It's it's actually a, a little essay about Miss Lou. And also, if you live in Toronto, go to Harbour Front center because there's a Miss Lou's room which is kind of like a mini museum in her honor and you'll see a mini oh. version of the statue that's in Jamaica there as well. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. Right. Well, I had such a good time. Yeah thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to uh, spend some time with you and hang out with you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I miss talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> I know talking to real people. <laughs> Honestly, I yeah. feel that. <laughs> All four books today were so amazing. I was just I was just blown away. Every story and yet they're all sort of connected in this beautiful way about communication and family and culture and we're all different and I know it sounds really cheesy but we're all the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure of uh, both of you. Thank um, you. Thank you so much. Okay. Awesome. It was a pleasure too. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Bye. All right. Thank you, Patricia. And thanks to Nadia, Danny, John, Eric, and Senna for your reading this morning. We're just about to head into our first break. Uh, we will be back at noon with a presentation by the Ontario Science Center, followed by readings for middle graders and teens. If you're looking for more readings like you just heard, our early readers programming re resumes tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Or visit our friends at Telling Tales Festival for an on-demand children's reading at tellingtales.org. Once again, our Kids and Teens programming returns at noon and, and our early readers programming is back tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. See you again soon.
A science notebook is essential to a scientist's work. Whether they're in the lab or in the field, scientists record their observations, thoughts, and questions in their science notebooks. Learn how to keep track of your experiences. The Ontario Science Center presented this paper making tutorial as part of our summer spectacular programming on August 25th. Learn how to make your own notebook from recycled paper and dried plant materials. Roll up your sleeves and get ready to go from pulp to paper.
Hi there, so sorry, we're currently experiencing, experiencing some technical difficulties. Uh, we will be resuming with our middle grade programming at 12.30, but no worries, the Ontario Science Center video will be available on our YouTube channel as a pre-recorded um, stream. So we will have that for you to watch this again. Thank you so much.
Welcome back to the Kids and Teen Stream. We are excited to introduce our host for the rest of the day, Angela Misery. Hello. Hey, Angela. So How Angela Misery, I'm pretty good. Um, so Angela Misery is an award-winning journalist, author, and educator. Her detective series called The Portia Adams Adventures is set in the 1930s, and her first middle grade series is called Tales of the Apocalypse. And the first book, Pickles versus the Zombies, was yeah. published by <laughs> Mormon Books tw in 2019. The second book in the series is called Trip of the Dead and will be coming out of the spring of 2021, which I'm super excited for. Awesome. <laughs> Welcome, Angela. So I am going to let you get right into it and I will hop right on off. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. No worries. So welcome everyone. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, I really wish I could see you all in person, but I will take this as a close second. Um, I get to talk to a whole bunch of authors this afternoon, so I hope you'll join me. I hope you'll tweet this out and Facebook it out and IG it out and let everyone know that this is happening because we really want to gather up the humans who love to read books. So please do join us. You can shop today's book list at Ella Minno, which is one of my favorite bookstores, elamino.ca, or find the link in our our live stream below. Um, and don't forget to check out our digital marketplace. You can access it through the Word on the Street Toronto website or again in the links below in the YouTube. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Andrea Curtis to join me because we're going to be talking about her book, A Forest in the City. That's it. Hello, there Miss it Andrea. Is. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, there it is. Show them up. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing well? I'm good. Yeah, what a gorgeous day. Thank you to anybody who's tuning in on this fabulous day. Yes, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to drop into the comments or like tweet us or Facebook us. We'd love to hear from you. Andrea is going to do a bit of a reading from A Forest in the City, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the story. So, Andrea, take it away. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, as uh, some of you will know, A Forest in the City is a nonfiction picture book, and the illustrations are by an incredible illustrator named Pierre Pratt. And uh, I think that you really need to see these pictures. So I'm going to hold them up to the, the, yeah. the book up to the screen as I yeah. read, and I'm uh, just going to read a couple pages. Love it. All right. How's that? Gorgeous. Yes. Imagine a city draped in a blanket of green a place where trees lean over sidewalks, lending shade to people and other creatures, where the air is cool and clean, where the trundle of streetcars and the sound of honking horns are muffled by the leaves and branches. Imagine a busy humming city with a lush canopy of leaves, making everyone down below feel safe, calm, and connected to the earth. Is this city you know? Our concrete jungles aren't always easy places for trees to grow. The soil beneath sidewalks and roads can be hard packed and lacking in nutrients. There are times when trees can't get, can't get enough rainwater. The heat can be withering. On some streets, skyscrapers are like the walls of a deep canyon, blocking out the natural sunlight that trees need to thrive. Meanwhile, artificial light from lampposts can disturb their natural rhythms, affecting the timing of leaf and blossom growth. And yet these green giants are essential to our urban spaces. With pollution and climate change fighting superpowers, trees help make life in cities more healthy and rich with possibility. So how do we create a forest in the city? How do we build a place where people and trees can grow together in harmony? As more and more of us around the world move into urban centers, the answers to these questions are becoming urgent. Wow. So you used to plant trees in Northern Ontario. Now you write books for children yeah. and adults. And you wrote a book called Eat This, which is nonfiction. Um, and it got a lot of good reviews. And then What's for Lunch, which was named Tavoya's honors, honors list. And you've also written a YA book called Big Water. So tell yeah. me what this book, why this book? What's this story? Well, I think that you kind of nailed it with the talk about tree planting. I have uh, bit, loved trees for a really long time. and. Uh, um, I'm not sure if any 
everybody who's watching today knows what tree planting is all about. But um, every year, uh, people go up into the north of Canada and some parts of the U.S. and plant little baby trees. They're just like this big. Um, and you, it's some days it's hundreds, some days it's yeah. thousands of trees and you, you strap on these big bags and you, and you the trees are in the pouches beside you and okay. you go into the bush and, you know, sometimes like people in BC are climbing up over huge mountains and trees and stuff. Sometimes it's wow. really easy, but it, it, I mean, it's not, it's never easy. That's the truth. <laughs> so um, that's how I made money to pay for school when I was in university. Oh, and uh, yeah. And I mean, it was a lot of fun, a lot of work. Um, yeah. And uh, so that probably was the start of my real understanding about how much I love trees, but, and, and actually the first thing I ever published was uh, an article about tree planting in Toronto life. And it was kind of part, partly about my experience there and partly about uh, what it's all about. So, um, and over the years, I just, I keep coming back to trees. I mean, they just, uh, I'm, I guess I really feel an affinity to them. Well, that's what I wanted to ask next, which was you've gone from like planting trees as part of, you know, growing up and, and earning a bit of money and becoming very Close to the trees, but then you bring that back to the city in this story. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, is well, it, I think the book that... is like. Sorry, go ahead. No, you you said the book is I, is about the city. Saying, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful yeah, it's a beautiful walk through an urban forest. So I mean, it's so picturesque and it's so like lush in its words. Uh, can you tell us about that? Uh, the, what is the message you're trying to bring across? Well, I mean, I think that one of the big stories in 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 a forest in the city is the urgency uh to make sure that we do everything kids can do uh, lots right. to to make sure our the trees in our cities thrive and uh uh we know that as i said when i was reading that they have climate change fighting superpowers and uh planting billions of trees uh, around the world is one of the biggest and cheapest ways of taking carbon dioxide out of the uh, atmosphere and tackling this climate crisis we're in. But I think one of the, um, one of the things that I've realized as I, as I have been talking about this book and researching this book is how you know, we think of trees as being in our forests, out, out in the, the right. wild, away right. from right. the city. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. But in fact, the trees in the city, they're everywhere. And uh, when you start to put on your tree goggles, <laughs> you see them everywhere and you start to really understand how deeply connected we are to those mm. trees and uh, and how important they are to our cities. I love the tree goggles. I, I now I'm visualizing my tree goggles. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're quite fancy. Um, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of talking points that come out of a story like this? Like when you're when you're doing when you're reading picture books to kids, it's all about the conversation, right? It's like what it prompts to come out. And what are you? Where should go for more information? Where should they look for a, a way to talk about forests in general and trees in general? Yeah, I think that I mean one of the the most important things that I think that that readers say to me is, is they just didn't understand how important trees are to us. And, um, you know, I think that, that one, you know, to, to realize that trees actually help us breathe. That's, that's a, like, yes. that's a pretty important role of one single fully grown tree creates enough oxygen for four people. And, um, you know, yeah. trees trap dirt and chemicals. They uh, help improve our health and reduce pollution in the city. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty amazing. And I, I think um, I'm sitting right now in my home office where I sit most days and uh, there used to be a huge hundred and something year old maple tree and it shaded me. And uh, sadly it fell and uh, you know, it, it was it was really old and fell, crushed car, <laughs> crushed our fence. And uh, luckily nobody was injured. But uh, since that tree has gone, my office is so hot. 
I'm like, it's just yes. because trees really do have a huge role. They say that uh, that a tree on the south side of a of a home will reduce your uh, cooling costs by thirty percent. That's a that's a lot. Um, so saving money, savings, energy savings. Um, but you know, some of the things that I'm really interested in, like I, the science is really interesting to me, but um, it's the sort of way that trees have an impact on us as people that um, mm -hmm. really engages me. So researchers have shown that people who live near trees or have access, you know, are able to see them uh, are less stressed. They uh, don't have as much depression. Um, and even so they did a study where, uh, people who were in hospital were able, they, they, they monitored how somebody who had a view of trees versus somebody who didn't. Mm -hmm. And the people who had a view of green spaces of trees, they recovered faster. So that's, a, that's, that's wow. a really big. Yeah. So it's a direct correlation. Guess, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess the, biggest story that I see and the thing that I talk most to kids about is how trees really bring us together. Hmm. Can you actually, you were going to do a screen share now. Is that, yeah, you're going to show us that? If, yeah, do you yeah. Let me see if I can. So, so, um, uh, yeah, I've been thinking about how, um, let's see, here we go. I'm going to share this. Do you, Take you your don't time. see it yet? Oh, you oh, do? Yeah. I see it. Okay, I see it. but yeah. I need presentation, view, Beautiful. right? Yeah. Okay. I see so it. It's you've gorgeous. Got... Okay, great. Um, so um, I just thought that I would talk a little bit about um, all the cool things. So I, I learned so much myself when I was researching this book about trees, but um, mm -hmm. Thought I'd share a couple of the really cool trees that that I came across. Um, this is not one that you're going to find in Toronto. It's called the rainbow tree. Is that wow. something you see? Yeah, great. Yeah, this is a really amazing tree. It's actually a kind of eucalyptus, and it lives in the rainforest in the Philippines and Indonesia, Papua New Guinea. And am I looking some, at the bark of the tree? Yeah, you are. And oh. uh, it what happens is that the bark you know how trees, you'll see the bark peeling off. Um, mm -hmm. And in this case, what happens is when the bark peels off, it reveals that really electric green color. And Gorgeous. then, but the, the bark doesn't peel off all at once. So as mm. that ages, it, it, it changes color and becomes this incredible rainbow color. And if you look online, if you're interested in this tree, you'll see ones that are like, pink and and electric neon green and blue and it's it's pretty spectacular it looks and where did you like say this grows it grows in uh, the rainforest in the philippines indonesia and papua new guinea oh uh, and uh Beautiful. the uh, yeah the, the next one is the k-pop ah. tree <laughs> i know look at those spikes it's pretty <laughs> nasty looking but this one grows in mexico and central america and south america as well as in West and Central Africa. And it's huge. It can reach about 200 feet. That's about 61 meters, maybe um, growing sometimes like 13 feet or four meters in a year. Um, so really thick, but some of the varieties like this particular one have these huge spikes that thorns kind of thing that grow out of them. And um, these thorns protect the tree bark when it's young um, and Ooh, they fall off. They're like porcupines. They are like porcupines. And and in a forest in the city, I talk a lot about um, some of the, the real challenges that trees in the city face. And uh, one of them is people peeling off the bark or the the it gets damaged because maybe a snowplow hits it or or something happens to the bark. And this Kapok tree has got it all figured out. It's uh it's not gonna let anything happen to that tender bark. Um Love it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. One of the things um, when you mentioned earlier, I wrote a book about um, a, a YA novel about a shipwreck called Big Water. And one of the things I learned when I was researching that was that the 
the um, silky fibers around the seed pods of this kapok tree were used about 100 years ago for stuffing life, life preservers. So huh. it's got it. Yeah, it's kind of cool. But the only problem is, is that when those uh, when those silky fibers uh, inside the life preserver got wet, it got super heavy. So uh, well, that luckily... wasn't a good plan. then. <laughs> <laughs> no. Luckily, we came up with some better uh, life preserver material. The uh, the next tree was the baobab tree that I was really interested in, and and it is huge. Uh, maybe some of our viewers have seen this kind of tree on uh, in the Lion King. It's known as the tree of life, and they can actually live up to twenty five hundred years. It's amazing. Like these wow. are ancient beings, you know, and uh, they can actually even be thicker around than they are. Um, uh, tall and people eat the leaves like spinach and they roast and boil the seeds for coffee, make jam, even beer gets made out of the seeds. Um, so it's a pretty cool tree. Well, 2,500 years, you could do a lot with that tree. I know it's true, but um, sadly, um, and this is part of the story in a forest in the city is uh, climate change is having a really big impact on these trees. And some of the oldest ones sadly have died recently. But the last trees I wanted to talk about were the hungry trees. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So um, no, we probably, everybody knows these are not a particular species. It's not like the baobab or the kapok or whatever, but um, these are just really incredible trees that even though they had some, uh, obstacles they decided not to um not to pay any attention and just grow anyway so the one eating the um uh, sign and the post box and the uh, bicycle uh they, the the bike i imagine just was like leaning against that tree and just the tree just kept growing but can you imagine amazing. how long it was leaning against that tree to hold still long enough to be like part of a tree <laughs> now i it's know crazy. Then there's the last, the very, very hungry trees. <laughs> um, this is a strangler fig, and it's growing in and out of a temple in Cambodia. Wow. Basically devouring the uh, the tree. So Yeah, the tree winning. The tree is winning. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm going to come back uh, to you now. <laughs> thank you so much so, for sharing that was amazing yeah yeah they're pretty amazing trees like you know those aren't trees necessarily other than the hungry ones that we find right. in toronto but uh they the book sort of travels around the world and looks at trees in cities everywhere so i thought that would be fun so can you tell us a little bit about the hashtag note to a tree yeah for sure i so you know i well, i'm really passionate about trees and and uh uh, I found as I have been talking about it and researching it, how much other people are also passionate about trees. And I heard this story that um, in Melbourne, Australia, the city forestry department um, decided to put an email address and a, a number on all of the trees in their city. And, and the idea was that they would get people to write in if they uh, saw a problem with the tree and then they'd know how to, ah, to got you it. know, to make sure it, a limb right. was, was cut if it was going to fall or something like that. But what happened and this total delight was that actually people started writing letters <laughs> to their trees, like love letters to Gorgeous. the trees in their city. And uh, so I decided that, that just taking a page from the people of Melbourne, that uh, it would be fun to do our own campaign to uh, write notes to a tree. So um, I've been encouraging kids and adults to write letters on social media, or maybe just in their class, post it on their fridge. Um, and for social media, using the hashtag uh, note to a tree. And, note to uh, a tree, I, people. Everyone take a, a minute and write your yes. note to a tree. Yes, post it on Instagram and, and Twitter and, and share the love. Um, there were just some beautiful, thank you, Angela. <laughs> there are just some beautiful things. And maybe I'll read a couple of if that's yes, all right. Yes, please. Yes. Um, I have a, a little friend and neighbor across the street. And uh, he wrote a note to 
his tree and he said, thank you for giving me shade. You help me by giving me air. I'm happy to see you every day, <laughs> Elias. <laughs> and then uh, another uh, young girl wrote to the apple tree in, that she loves. And she says, you've been with me my whole life and I love climbing you. You're always reminding me that there is beauty in the darkest places. I love you. <laughs> so nice. Do you, do you have a favorite tree, Angela? Do you have a tree that you visit? Or? I do. I have a tree down the street that whenever it blooms, it has those big pink flowers. I'm not quite sure which tree kind of tree it is, but whenever it blooms, it always like sparks my life. And I look forward to walking past it um, yeah. every season when that happens. And then when they land on the ground, I get sad and I often like pick them up and take them home with me the flowers yes so and maybe a magnolia <laughs> the magnolia yeah, is the I one that it, it yeah it only blooms for a really short time and but it's extraordinary yeah it's at the yeah. end of my block and it's not like my favorite it's like right near my bus stop and uh, it just cheers me up yeah no I I, I, what I, about I, you? I yeah I, I I mean that one that I described earlier that fell I I really love that tree and uh I was very sorry to see to see it go, not only because um, uh, it made my office really hot, <laughs> um, but because I would, you know, I'd watch the creatures, the squirrels running and the birds and so on. But luckily, um, the tree right there beside my home is on city property and the city actually planted a new one. And oh. it's a beautiful red maple and it's it oh. started to grow and uh last year i had the pleasure of watching a robin family um uh build a nest i mean it was just like it was it was like watching a drama on television <laughs> to see right. this it was right at my eye level and uh yeah they 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 built the nest, they brought string and straw, and then they uh, went, they sat, they took turns sitting on the eggs. And, you know, it was, I just, I mean, I was like, I can't leave because I think the <laughs> eggs are going to happen. <laughs> it was so fun. So, it's like reality yeah. TV, except Robin. It's perfect. I love exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I mean, if people do want to write letters to their uh, trays, please do and, and definitely post them on social media. Um, I did a, a little craft tutorial for teachers and parents if they thought it would be fun. It's um, up on my uh, website and it's, uh, you know, right, making um, cards that you might uh post on your fridge or something or, or just share with your family that you'd write a note to a tree. It's uh, www.andreacurtiskids.ca. So Perfect. it should be easy to find. Yeah. And, and it just uses stuff that you might have around the house, newsprint and hopefully crayons or paint awesome. or whatever. So, so yeah. before we wrap things up for the day, I'm going to remind people you've got a note to a tree and you can, um, tag Miss Andrea Curtis on it so she can see all your wonderful letters. I would love to see that happen. Um, you can get Andrea's book from uh, Ella Minow, which is supplying our books for this Toronto Word on the Street. So Ella um, You can find the link in our YouTube scroll. Before we go, Andrea, I was wondering if there was any sort of like activities you were suggesting for people as we're in pandemic. Like we still need to be exposed to forests and trees and all the benefits. Is there any activities that you're suggesting um, people can do? Well, I mean, the, I think everybody, as they're able, should get outside and, and to try to enjoy okay. the parks. And the, certainly while we have nice weather, too, um, there's a, an idea that, that was popularized in Japan called forest bathing. And yes. uh, it's it's not the idea. It's not like getting naked and, and running through the woods. <laughs> I, I thought it was. I mean, who wouldn't? Forest bathing. But it is It is actually going out into, maybe it's a park, maybe it's just your street, maybe it's the ravine in Toronto, and really just consciously taking in nature, um, you know, acknowledging those trees, just absorbing it. And I'll tell you, it brings me a huge amount of solace and, and pleasure and happiness and uh you know, trees are, are working hard for us. So I think oh, definitely right. get outside. <laughs> 
And the trees are about to be changing for us too. So like my tree that's out front, I think it's also a, a red maple is starting to change color. How about yours? Yeah, absolutely. It is. And uh, they're glorious. They, they, um, they provide us so much pleasure and the, and the, the squirrels and birds are going nuts. Try, well, not birds so much, but squirrels anyway, going nuts, <laughs> uh, making uh, their plans for the winter. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh the, the colors, the changing colors are just spectacular right now. So that's Forest in the City. If anyone doesn't have that yet, it is a gorgeous picture book. Who illustrated again? Can you say again? Yeah, his name is uh, Pierre Pratt and uh, it's published by Groundwood Books. Uh, and it's actually uh, the first in a series of books wow. and the series is called Think Cities. And they're, mm -hmm. they're all about... Um, uh, urban systems and uh, environmental issues. The next one is actually coming out in the spring and it's called City of Water. So I'll watch wow. for that too. That, yeah. That's also yours or just in the same yeah. series? Yeah. Oh, wow. I, that's, yeah, can you give us a little the, bit about that without, do you think? Yeah, no, sure. The, the book uh, City of Water is all about water in the city. So um, it tra it tracks water from the source in the watershed, mm -hmm. maybe lakes and rivers, depending on where you are, maybe the mountains, if you're somewhere mountainous. And then as it goes through uh, all the various systems, cleaning, uh, storage, et cetera, to get to your tap. And then, of course, to go back. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a, um, again, it's beautifully illustrated. It's not, uh, it's a new illustrator. Each book will have a, a different illustrator. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to, to be talking about that too. Water is another of my passions. So it's perfect. So is that, uh, if people want to pay attention to that and get updates on that, should they just follow you? Is that the best way yes. to get that? Okay. That Everybody go great. and follow. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody Please go do. follow. <laughs> and your website again was? It's andreacurtiskids.ca. Perfect. Everybody yeah. go follow. If you want to keep up with all this beautiful um, art and beautiful books coming out, there's only one way to do it, and that is to stay and pay attention to your favorite authors. Andrea, thank you so much. Thank this you, Angela. Amazing. Great. Thanks. It's a delight. Thank it's you. A delight. I will talk to you later. All right. So just a reminder that you can shop any of the books today in the book list with Elemino Book Bookstore, uh, elemino.ca. So, oh, it's down there, awesome. So I don't have to keep like spelling that out, elemino.ca. Um, and don't forget to check out our digital marketplace. So access it through the Word on the Street Toronto website or at the link right there. Look at the timing on this, this is doing really well. So coming up next, we're talking to Michael Hutchinson in a few minutes. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much all. Oh, hey. Awesome. That Hello. <laughs> Hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. I was waiting. It's a good thing I didn't step away. I was waiting for another two minutes, but uh, I'm here. And so let's get it done if that's, uh, that's yes. what we're doing. So we're talking about your book, The Case of the Missing Auntie, correct? Yes. It's book two in the Mighty Muskrat Mystery Series. Um, they're sort of, uh, I guess, First Nation Hardy Boy books, I guess, would kind of be a, a close approximation. They're, they're four kids uh, on the fictional Windy Lake First Nation. And uh, this is book two. They head to the city and they're looking for a missing auntie. They're the, uh, the female character, the female muskrat, uh, Chickadee, as she's walking out the door, she says, Grandpa, do you need anything from the city? And he says, well, I'm missing a little sister. And that's sort of the, where, where everything gets started. Right. And you're a member of the Mississippiustic Cree Nation, uh, north of Winnipeg. Um, you live in Ottawa these days? That's yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Grand Rapids is the sort of the English name of my reserve. Uh, it is, if you look at a map of Manitoba, there's sort of the big lake. And then where the North yeah. Saskatchewan runs into the lake, uh, that's where my reserve is. And it was a very important intersection uh, mm -hmm. for, I guess, Canadian history and our people. Uh, it was an important fishing spot for our people. And our community became very important during the fur trade. Because of the rapids, there was uh, a, a Hudson's Bay factory uh, or warehouse, I guess, at the top of the, the falls. And then there was one at the bottom. And so people from my community used to carry stuff between those two um, warehouses and then also use York boats to go down the falls, which is something my uncles could do. And then 
Uh, and then the first railway lines in Western Canada were laid on my reserve in that, uh, and then there was a tramway that took um, goods up and down the falls. And then eventually in about the 1950s, uh, Canada decided to build a hydro dam on the falls and, uh, and now they're silent. Uh, the falls no longer run. And so my community, Mississippuistic, uh, means uh, uh, big sounding waters. Uh, thunder ah. waters, I guess. And if you, uh, if you, and now those waters are silent. And so the elders always speak about missing, missing that sound. Misopolistic. It's such a great word. Um, can you, before I get you into, to do a reading for us, can you tell us where this specific story came from in your life? Because from the notes I got, it was, you were trying to instill a uh, pride in Indigenous youth and educate others about First Nation communities. Can you talk a bit about that? Sure. Uh, I am, uh, you know, I, I'm somebody who grew up, uh, well, I guess the way to be a good person in my culture is to uh, use your talent for the good of the community. And so I, my talent is, uh, was recognized, I guess, as a young age as being able to write. My dad hated TV. And so sometimes he took TV out of the house for whole seasons. And so we read a lot. Um, okay. and, uh, and so, uh, so I became a journalist and then later on I moved to the other side of the desk and became a communications officer kind of person. And so I switched back and forth throughout my career, usually working for indigenous organizations and indigenous publications. And mm -hmm. so I always had these conversations with Canadians and first nations about, you know, um, about different ways first nation people think a lot of people look at First Nations as sort of monolithic or, or only fitting into a few different stereotypes. And ultimately, we are a community that when something happens, you know, it ripples out and there's people who look at things from different perspectives. And so I wanted to bring that into the stories. Um, I also grew up in a family that, uh, you know, like every family, your dad starts out, you know, uh, at the bottom of his career and he gets bigger. And so, you know, when my dad had seven kids, and so when he was, you know, uh, a young worker, he, uh, he, uh, we, were, we weren't that wealthy. So, you know, I said earlier that I read the Hardy Boy books and, uh, and those kids, they had a lot more money than our family did. They had dirt bikes and all that kind of stuff. So, so this is sort of where um, I wanted to write books that were sort of talking to kids that had my experience more and that explained the idea that, that not all First Nation people think alike. You know, you're saying the Hardy Boys, and I already knew that your book was exactly down my alley because I write mysteries and I love reading mysteries, and I, I grew up on Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys, absolutely true. Um, can you tell us about the Mighty Muskrats before you do your reading? I know I keep saying I'm going to let you read. I am, but I want to hear about the yeah. Mighty Muskrats. <laughs> well, and, and you know, I, I will talk until somebody tells me to shut up. So if I'm talking too much, just let me know and, and uh, just give me little clues and I will wrap things up. Uh, yeah, so they're they're... In First Nation families, what happens is that uh, the young people are are herded together. And so age groups, you know, uh, you get the older age groups of kids looking after the younger age group. This happens in many cultures, but in First Nation families, it happens. Um, and so uh, and so kids get lumped together in their age groups. And I have cousins who who are like my brothers and sisters to me because we grew up together. Right. And uh, and even my family, when they see us together, they see us as a sort of one group. And so, uh, so this is the Mighty Muskrats, and and they're uh, a Tim and Sam are, are brothers. They they kind of move to the res from the city, uh, so they have some city experience. Um, but and, and they're sort of figuring out the res. And then there's Otter. Otter is sort of the spiritual uh, leader of the group, I guess you can say, in that that he grew up with Grandma and Grandpa. His his parents uh, passed away through due to a car accident, and so he grew up with Grandpa. And he he learned uh, the spiritual ways and the ceremony and the bushcraft uh, that goes along with with growing up with your elders. And then um, and then Chickadee uh, is the female uh, muskrat, and she is sort of the uh, the motivator. Um, and uh, you know, each one has their own little talent. And and um, Chickadee's great with computers. And uh, and uh, you know, uh, Sam is sort of like the book reader and the the thinker, and he's sort of the the leader of the group. Uh, Tim is sort of the brawn; he's the tallest and the fastest. Yeah. And uh, and then Otter being the spiritual one. So uh, so yeah, that's the Mighty Muskrats in a nutshell. I'm basically Chickadee, so I was really excited by her. She's the best. Um, <laughs> can you give us a bit of a reading? You think? 
Sure. Uh, five minute reading. This is the first couple of pages of the case of the missing auntie. Grandpa hasn't seen his little sister since she was taken. As she looked out the back window of the van, Chickadee grappled with the concept of forceful, forcefully being pulled from her family. The mighty muskrats were on their way to the city. That morning, they had piled into Auntie Maud's vehicle and had spent the past six hours counting license plates, watching for animals, both wild and farmed, and stopping at gas stations to pee and then refuel with chips and pop. Taken? Grandpa's little sister? What do you mean? A Tim, seated in, seated in the middle, flicked his long hair out of his eyes and scratched his belly. Samuel had the other window, but his nose was buried in a book. Otter was riding shotgun and talking with his aunt. Auntie Maud looked in the rearview mirror at her niece. Chickadee's long black hair hung over her shoulders. She was wearing her favorite black hoodie and looked back at her auntie in the mirror with bright, empathetic eyes. Grandpa told you about his missing sister? Auntie Maud gave her a quizzical look. Chickadee nodded. Otter pulled his feet off the dashboard and turned his skinny frame to see his cousin better. His cropped black hair, button nose, and cute face made him look younger than his 11 years. Auntie Maud was impressed with Grandpa's trust in her niece. He doesn't talk about that much. I only learned about it from Uncle Levi. Chickadee responded to her aunt's reflection. I asked him what he wanted from the city, and he said all he wanted to know was where they put his baby sister. He said this winter she had called to him in a dream, and then he told me what happened long ago. Short version, I think. Auntie Maud nodded. It's a sad story. Your great Great grandpa died in an accident at work. Your grandpa was a, just a teenager. Great grandma Doris tried hard to provide for the family. She worked hard. Young grandpa did too. But one day when Doris came home from work, the police and the government workers were taking her children away. Your grandpa too. They said they were too many kids, said they were too poor. But grandpa has brothers and sisters. The largest and most muscled of the muskrats of Tim shook his big head slight, slightly and the fringe of hair over his eyes danced. His mother looked at him in the mirror. Yeah, but the older kids got sent to residential school. Eventually, they came back. Grandpa's younger sister never did. She was scooped. Scooped? Otter gave his aunt a quizzical look. Yeah, started back in the 50s, lasted until the 80s. The government took thousands of First Nation kids and put them up for adoption or fostering, often without the permission or knowledge of their families. Many of them were sent to other provinces or down to the States or to faraway countries like New Zealand. Auntie Maud shook her head sadly. She looked at her son's in the rearview mirror. I just couldn't imagine someone taking you away from me. What would that do to my heart? It would be broken. So there were residential schools and scoops? Otter winced. His parents had been taken away from him by a car accident when he was young. Otter knew the pain of losing his mother and father. Yes, yeah, some say that when the residential schools got a bad reputation and they were being shut down, the government's next assimilation tactic was the scoops. There were TV and magazine advertisements about First Nation kids for adoption. Isn't that crazy? Auntie Maud's voice was incredulous. So that's what happened to great Auntie Charlotte. Chickadee's voice was filled with disappointment. That's her name? Auntie Maud was impressed again. Chickadee nodded. Wow, Grandpa must really trust you. Even Levi didn't know that. Charlotte. She caught her niece's eye in the mirror. I have a great Auntie Charlotte, Otter beamed, but then frowned. Out there. Somewhere. I had a friend who was scooped. Auntie Maud's lips tightened as she told the story. He was a good guy, but confused, you know. He grew up brown in a white family in a white town. He said he never fit in. When he came back home, he didn't fit there either. He didn't know how to be an Indian. Auntie Maud scoffed sadly and looked at Otter. The poor guy never had a home. Imagine if your little sister was suddenly gone. Chickadee's voice was filled with sadness at the thought. You don't even know if she was being hurt by a stranger. No way of knowing if she was okay. If she was with good people. But Tim's mother cringed as she drove. Grandpa usually has a reason for telling people things. Maybe this should be the next mission for us mighty muskrats, Chick Chickadee ventured. The exhibition fair is our next mission. A Tim squealed with delight. It's the best week in the city. We got money from dad and grandpa, so we have cash to spend. Samuel spoke up over the rim of his book and the sound of the van. Chickadee was thinking of her Auntie Charlotte, but an excited a Tim hugged her so tightly, he squeezed a thought away. You guys have never been to the X, a Tim beamed. There's the cyclone, it spins you in a circle. And then there's the rattler that kind of spins you in a circle while waving you up in the air like this. A Tim's long arm swung back and forth from his elbow. Never mind the exhibition. They've never been to the city, ever. Samuel chuckled at his older brother. A Tim punched him in the leg. The two boys began to wrestle, rough but playful. 
Chickadee and Otter looked at each other and shrugged. It was true. They were almost teenagers, but had never been to the city. Now they were on their way. The thought filled them both with excitement and fear. On one hand, there were the many stories of city-based adventures told by a Tim and Sam and their older cousins. On the other hand, were all the horrors and crimes and all the young adult movies and TV shows that were pumped out to the remoteness of Windy Lake. I think that's a natural end, so I'll just stop there. This is a little bit more to the chapter, but that's a good place to stop. That was incredible. Uh, Michael, I think you have to write about something. I mean, you've chosen to write about something so hard. It's a hard thing to write about. It's a hard thing to read about. And I learn every time. Every time I read a, a book about a different culture, a different community, I obviously learn. I, for example, didn't know that the 50s and 60s scoop included sending people as far as New Zealand. That's like, it just adds to the crazy in my, my mind. But how is it you do that? How do you write about something that's so like intrinsically uh, sad in your community and so like decades long, but you still write about it with hope. Like I read your book in one sitting and I was left with a feeling of hope. So can you talk a little bit about how you write about this? Well, uh, you know, I guess first off, kids aren't dumb. Uh, you know, ki children are <laughs> children are, are human beings. And in, in my, uh, my uh, um, culture, you know, um, you know, that there, there's constant, you had somebody talk about trees earlier, that there's a the concept of the little acorn. And, and that um, uh, a tree has to grow naturally. And if you prune it too much, and if you, if you, you, you mess with it too much, it, it doesn't grow naturally. And so, so children have to grow naturally and be who they are. And, and so uh, that, you know, contributes to our rules around discipline and stuff like that, but that's a whole different topic. But, uh, you know, we're disciplined by our uncles and you see some of that in the books, I guess, that, that coming through. We're disciplined by our aunties and uncles rather than our parents so much because of that idea of the little acorn. But, you know, kids, you know, when, when somebody dies in their family, they have to go to a funeral. And they have to deal with all those concepts, you know. Um, and so I just talk as though they're human beings that have to talk about this stuff. And they do. And, um, and yeah, it's sad. And, you know, we are a couple of generations along. And so in my culture, there's also the concept of the seven generations. And, and so that the seven generations, of, you know, behind you influence who you are. And so... I guess, it, you know, to speak about my seven generations, my mother went to residential school. Um, in the story, there's there's a story about a girl who was strapped uh, for speaking English um, in residential school. That happened to my mom. She was She's a helper. She's a nurse now. Always been somebody who goes and helps people. And uh, my uh, a girl was fresh off the res. She, she, she hurt herself in the playground of the residential school. And in her pain, she started speaking Cree. And my mom went to help her and, and started speaking Cree to her. And they both got the strap for speaking Cree in the residential school. Um, and, but at the same time too, my mother, when the residential school apology and stuff like that, did not go get her, her, her restitution money, I guess you could call it. Uh, she felt that the nuns helped her. She felt that the nuns, uh, 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 you know, um, that even though there were some very bad experiences there for her, and, and in my family, I think it was a lot harder on the men than it was on the women. That may have just been, you know, the experience of that residential school, but that's how it seemed to come out in my family. And so I have to take all that stuff into account. My mom's feelings on residential and schools like that, because that's part of my seven generations, right? I also work, uh, you know, with First Nation advocacy organizations. So through the, TR, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission process and all that stuff, you know, I, you know, all that stuff was part of my work and, and, and uh, you know, not that I was involved with that, but, you know, that rippled out and, and it involved the organizations that I was working for. And so, so yeah, there is a human experience there. And, and these things come down to touching people's hearts and minds. And, and then how does that filter through as it goes through the seven generations? And so, yeah. um, you know, the feelings of one generation are, are, are different in the next generation. And so, you know, that separation helps in writing about it. Uh, but mm -hmm. also there are some very real outcomes. You know, a lot of those people, some of those people didn't come back. And a lot of those kids who were scooped are trying to find themselves now. And that's a hard process. And, um, 
And yeah, I, I did want to I did want to offer hope, but I also wanted to bring in the sadness that can be in there as well. You know, some people have told me, one reviewer said, uh, you know, have you ever read a kid's book where you're crying one moment and then laughing the next, you know? Um, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and yeah, and so, so, you know, that's, I wanted to bring in the sadness, but I also wanted to bring in the idea that there are no residential schools now. I think Canada's, Canada is moving to a better place. I work at the Assembly of First Nations, so I'm dealing constantly with our issues and, you know, the response or lack of response to them. But, but, you know, the, uh, the, um, you know, and I'm dealing with all that stuff. And so that's part of the thinking of these books is, is how do we explain this to Canadians in a way <laughs> to be a little bit selfish that makes my job easier later on when I'm dealing with Canadian adults, when I'm dealing so that they have a base of knowledge, um, See, you know, I babbled so long, I, I forgot the original question. No, but, uh, it's, it's, a very it <laughs> <laughs> it's a very smart approach. You're growing a generation of humans that are going to be more empathetic and more understanding and more knowledgeable. It's really smart. It's a great approach. I like it. Well, you know, I was, I was being interviewed by somebody once and they said, are you trying to politicize the kids? And I thought, <laughs> no. well, that's kind of a weird question. Uh, you know, I'm trying to to present a perspective and... Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, not everybody knows, everybody might know the history, but knowing the emotional and, and family fallout that comes from that and explaining to the end story is a good way to do that, you know, uh, and mysteries are a good way to, to slowly present a drip, drip of information um, that where I can drip out, you know, my, my main plot and then my secondary plot, as well as the sort of the middle history that links them to. Yeah, it doesn't all just smack you in the head with like, this is the message, this is the message. It's like you hear the message as you solve the mystery. I'm actually sending my copy of your book now that I'm done it to my uh, nephew in the States. He's um, nine. And I've been thinking about what other conversations this is going to prompt us to have about this, like, because his knowledge will be even less. He lives in the States. So I need to like get educated on this stuff. Is there anything else you guys, that, I'm sorry, is there anything else that you personally are trying to, you know, start the conversation on amongst us? Well, you know, each book has a, uh, has a secondary story. Uh, right. And so there's the main mystery arc. And then so, as I said before, that it, the idea is to show different poles of First Nation thinking. So in the case of Windy Lake, the first one, there is um, the muskrats have, a, have, have a, on Windy Lake, it's a fictional First Nation. I have kind of thrown in a whole bunch of things so that I have options to play with as a writer later. So this is a fictional First Nation that has a mine affecting its traditional territory. That mine gets its uh, electricity from a dam that is built on its traditional territory. Um, and so uh, so I have things to play with as I'm going around. There's there's a place called the Refuge, which is an ancient site uh, that first, you know, and and then there's a junkyard. Uh, the kids have a an awesome fort uh, that is built in an old um, bombardier but they actually sneak through the back of the bombardier into this old hidden school bus um, that is the real fort. And they have computers in there and their guitar and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but anyway, so these secondary stories are, are to show those two different poles. So uh, the muskrats meet, uh, or they have a cousin, Denise, who is, who is uh, protesting the environmental damage that's happening in their uh, traditional territory due to the mine and the power dam. At the same time, throughout the, the plot of the story, they meet a young uh, First Nation man who is a single father who is making a better life for his children by working at the mine. He's aware of the environmental degradation, but at the same time, too, he's got a job to do. He's got a family to feed. And so you have these two poles. In the case of the missing auntie, they, they have a cousin who is, is, you know, he's got problems in the city, but he's learned a way to be fairly successful in the city. And he's he's volunteering for things, and he's he's a full person within the city. And then they meet a young man who is is well, he's having problem maintaining his own freedom from those people around him. And he is having his you know his personality as well as as his his perspective and his future prospects in many ways uh, shortened because of what he's going through in the experience. So you have these two poles in the. Uh, third book, uh, the case of the burgled bundle, which will be out next spring. The two poles are: um, we have 
in First Nation spirituality, in First Nation cultures right now, there's this conversation going on about do we bring out our ceremonies and show everybody our ceremonies or do we still keep them hidden because colonialism is still a thing? And so you meet people who feel in these two different ways. And so, yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to kind of show that there is what's going on in First Nation communities right now as far as the local, the current thinking, but that there, there are poles and there are different perspectives within the community. People often underestimate that. They assume entire communities have one opinion on something when they're incredibly diverse, like any other any other group of humans. There's a there's a lot of opinions. So before I forget, um, if people want to know more about this book and the next book, should they follow you on the Twitter? Is that the best way to stay in touch and hear more from you? Yeah, that is uh, my Twitter site. And yeah, anything that's going on with the book or any new books I put out through that, that's uh, Mike Hutchinson with the, the O is a zero. It keeps me humble. <laughs> That's why I've got the, the slash through it. I'm like, I don't want people That's to follow That's a great idea. Good, 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 good. <laughs> All right. So everyone go and follow because the third book you said was coming out in the spring? In the spring of uh, 2021. Yes. And I'm currently writing uh, the working title right now is The Case of the Rig Race. Uh, and it, and uh, it'll probably be out the following spring. And uh, that's about a dog sled on Windy, or dog sled race on Windy Lake that, uh, well, someone starts to mess with it. You're a machine. Just popping them out there. I love this. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> I just love that. So um, you also work, I was just going to give you a chance to tell us a little bit about where you work, because I don't know if everyone knows that you work at the Assembly of First Nations. Can you just give us a little bit about what that is and what your job is there? Well, uh, the Assembly of First Nations is an advocacy organization. I should say, I guess, just to uh, make the AFN's lawyers happy, my opinions are not, may or may not be those of the Assembly of First Nations. <laughs> I am the interim uh, communications director at this time. What the AFN is, is uh, an advocacy organization. Now, if you look at Canadian government, uh, Canadians have elected officials. If they have a problem, they can go to their elected mayor, they can go to their elected MLA, they can go to their elected MP. And um, these guys overlap a little bit in jurisdiction, so they can kind of all make certain that Canadians are taken care of. Now, under the First Nation system, uh, under the Indian Act, there is your elected mayor, the chief, there is your appointed or well hired by Canada regional director of IN, uh, ISC, Indigenous Services Canada, and then there is your appointed Minister of ISC. So, uh, oops, really, really the uh, the First Nation system really only has democracy at the bottom level. So, what the AFN is is an advocacy org that tries to say, "Hey guys, can you sort of make provincial and federal laws this way?" And so we can kind of try to affect the system, but we are ultimately outside it. And uh, the top two levels of the system are held by. Uh, unelected people. There's a democracy deficit in the Indian Act, and that's why it doesn't move forward. Again, my opinions may or may not be those of the Assembly of First Nations. Um, and so uh, and so that's what I do. And so we try to, uh, you know, uh, democracy through representation is something that we try to include. So, so the chiefs come together in assembly, usually twice a year. COVID has put a you know, made things difficult, but we're trying to get online right now. Um, and, and they make decisions. And we don't pass law we pass resolutions. And so AFN is basically told by the chiefs in assembly what to advocate for and that sort of thing. And then my job as communications director is to make certain that people know about that stuff and, uh, and write speeches for the national chief and uh, press releases and all that kind of fun stuff. Amazing. Okay. So I'm going to remind everyone where they can follow Mike. Oops, right there. Mike Hutchinson. Oh, I think you might have froze there. Well, uh, there, are you back? There you are. Sorry, back. am I still here? <laughs> yeah, you're here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, since she's freezing, I'm going to take the moment. Here's something that I, I, I kind of wanted to mention. This is a uh, representation of a treaty medal that I got. I'm a member of Treaty 5. If you look on there, that's a, that's a Canadian in a funny hat and, uh, and a First Nation person there. And, and that's something that I feel is very important and is a aspect of my books. Uh, my uh, my people um, made treaty and uh, they wanted to share their land with Canada in a very real way, share the land. And uh, and so I'm a, a great supporter of treaty and uh, and I'm happy uh, that my ancestors signed treaty with Canada. 
and um, and yeah, we got some stuff to work out, but uh, uh, I'm I'm hopeful and opportunist or, or op opportunist, optimistic, <laughs> and so uh, optimistic. you can see that in my book. Okay, so um, and they can get all of the books. Anyone can get all of the books from elemino.ca, correct? Yes, and uh, my publisher is Second Story Press. Uh, I want to thank them very much. They're uh, they've been helping me out a lot. I'm a you know a new author, and uh, and they've been very helpful. So thank you to Second Story. Well, I'm really excited to get the first book because you've hooked me on the muskrats. They're awesome. Good, good. I'm glad. I'm I hope sorry. everybody gets to meet the muskrats. <laughs> so I'm going to let Michael go, and uh, you guys can please enjoy a reel of our lovely Word on the Street 2020 sponsors now. So thank you very much, and I will see you soon. I'll be back with Jay Torres and Tim Levins.
Hello and welcome back to Word on the Street Toronto. This is the kids and YA and middle grade uh, stage. My name is Angela Mystery. Um, I am an author. I write the Pickles vs. the Zombies middle grade series and the YA series over there, which is the Portia Adams Adventures. I'm here today to talk about Planet Hockey, right there, written by Jay Torres and Tim Levins. And I'm super excited to invite them up. Can I get, yay. Oh, oh, yes, working. Hey, Angela. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> Good. Um, I can hear, I think, one of you. Jay Torres, I don't think your mic's on. There we go. How's that? That's way better. Thank you very much. So I'm, <laughs> so, uh, I'm. So uh, I'm going to do a bit of an intro for you guys, but I got to tell you, this is the hardest intro ever because if you looked at my bookshelf, it's basically just filled with what you guys do for a living, and I'm, <laughs> I'm jealous. I'm super jealous. You get to do this. <laughs> So Jay Torres is a Canadian comic book writer best known for his run on DC Comics Teen Titans. Oh, yes. And there's Planet Hockey, yes. The Eisner-nominated Allison Dare and TD Summer Reading Club write title Bigfoot Boy, winner of the Schuster Award for Outstanding Writer. Oh, look, my juice is coming. Ooh, my juice has arrived. Yay. Um, Torres has worked with characters from A, the Archies, to Z, the Mighty Zodiac. Tim Levins. Look at Torres. He's just like one after the other. What's happening? Yeah, it just happened. Just like these happen to be in all my bookshelves. Um, Tim Levins studied fine art and classical animation before breaking into the comic book business, which when we get off this talk, we're going to have a discussion about. He worked on the Eisner Award winning DC comic series Bat Batman Gotham Adventures, which is on my shelf as well. Illustrated many titles for DC, Marvel, and Archie Comics, and has drawn several children's books. Tim lives with his family in Midland, Ontario. Welcome, gentlemen. How are you? Good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks awesome. For, um, for moderating for us. Not at all. I mean, I'm super excited and a little jealous. I think that's a fair thing to be when you're sitting here on the moderating side. It's going to be awesome. So we're going to talk about Planet Hockey, and you were going to share your screen so that we could yes. talk about it, because it's a graphic novel, in case anyone didn't know. Yeah, we were gonna do a, a short reading. Yeah, can... that would be great. All right, so here we go. Can you guys see that? Not yet. Oh, yes, can. Okay, here we go. Yes, you can see it? I can see it. Okay. Yeah, I can see it, I get it. All right, so <laughs> here we go. Um, Tim Levins and Jay Torres doing a reading of Planet Hockey. We've only rehearsed once, so uh, please be kind. It's going to be <laughs> fine. It's going to be fine. Right, Planet <laughs> Hockey, the first star of the game. Like most kids, Isaac has had his share of accidents. Last season, Isaac had an unfortunate accident that led to this season's unlikely incident. It all started in the playoffs. Go, Iceman! You can do it. Whoa. <laughs> oh. I suck. I cost us the game. You caught an edge, son. It happens. Everyone hates me. I hate me. Nobody hates you, Isaac. I'm never playing hockey ever again. Chapter one. You goat it all wrong. Hockey, the world's fastest team sport. A hard hitting sport. A popular sport. Popular not only on this planet, but on many others, including worlds where the game moves even faster hits a lot harder and is played a little bit differently. Ding. Ding. One warp jump and two sleeps away from Earth on the planet Galaxia. Not only is hockey played faster, harder, and more than a little bit differently, but the stakes are also higher for its citizens. On Galaxia, the more you lose, 
the more taxes you pay. And the team with the worst, the worst stats also cleans everyone else's equipment. So saith the supreme leader of Galaxia, the boss of everyone, and self-proclaimed number one hockey fan in the universe, Emperor Mad Maroon. The Galaxian Hockey League, or GHL, has an annual tournament. For the last 10 lunar cycles, the worst team has been the Pods. Loser. Well, that was uncalled for. We cannot keep losing like this. Z-Side is running out of his hand dollars to pay the hockey tax. I am tired of always being thrown. I am tired of watching everyone else's stinky equipment. We need a good coach, a robot coach. We cannot afford a robot coach, not even a not so good one. But I believe we have enough sand dollars for a scout. Oh, scouts are also expensive, but not this one. There's the only one under a thousand sand dollars. Hey there, scout here is a great robot, especially for that low, low price. He can fly a spaceship. It's a competent contract negotiator. He can make grilled seed sandwiches. Scout looks a little old. How up to date is the GPS? Well, Pluto was still a planet the last time its galactic positioning software was updated. Scout's GPS is totally up to date. The best, mostly, a uh, little. Anyway, you won't find anything cheaper in all of Galaxia. I hope Scout finds the hockey goal for us. I hope the GPS works. And thus, Scout was tasked to recruit the best hockey player in the cosmos, the hockey goat from planet Gurf 3. The hockey goat has won six Cosmic Hockey League championships as the captain of a team called the 789s. The hockey goat has played hockey ever since he was a kid, but he is not this kid the one called Isaac from planet Earth. On Earth, Isaac became the greatest of all time in the multi, uh, multiplayer online game SHOT, short for Super Hockey Online Tournament. So all of these GOATs and leagues, online or otherwise, caused the confusion that eventually led to the unlikely incident. Hmm. Where is that robot? <laughs> not long after the unfortunate accident. I know it's not real hockey, but I hear shot is really popular. Thought I'd give you something to do instead of moping. And a few months after that. Come watch the game with us. It's Hot Town in the Royals in the semifinals. Nope, oh, I'm good. And a few months after that. Are you sure you don't want to sign up for hockey camp this summer? You love hockey camp. Nope, oh, I'm good. And a few months after that. Isaac, the kids across the street are playing shinny with Lily, who just moved in next door. You should meet her. Nope, oh, I'm good. And on the first day of school. Yes, I know where I'm putting the puck before I even get it. I'm going to rank up here if I win. Yes, top five. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think you can take me. Come on, then. Come on. He shoots. He scores. Yes, number one. I'm the best. Isaac, turn that off. I told Lily's mom you'd walk with her. It's her first day, and she's new. Mom, look at that. Okay, congrats, goat789. But you'll be late if you don't leave now. Bye. Hey, Isaac, wait up. I'm Lily. You're supposed to show me around? Oh, right. So, um, how's your new house? I hate it. I miss my old room. I miss my friends. I'd rather be anywhere but this stupid place. Gee, thanks. Sorry, no offense. Like, the hogs aren't so bad. I just didn't want to move here. Hogs fan? Yeah, you? They're okay. I like the Royals. Their goalie's the best. Do you play? Yeah, you could say I'm the best. Oh, really? Really? I'm known as the goat in my league. The greatest of all time. Huh. 
I'm a golem. Golem? For real? Are you are you any good? I'm okay, I guess. Only six shutouts last season. But I got nine before that, the year before that. Nine shutouts! Hey, we're the same age, right? So we'll be in the same league. Maybe even on the same team. Yeah, but I'm not sure if I'm going to play the C. Let's play after school with the kids across the street. Um, I can't. I have a doctor um, teeth appointment. Tim. Later. And not at a doctor teeth appointment. Wow. She's good. Uh, yeah, really good. Why don't you go out there and play with them? I have to, you know, do homework things. <laughs> Look, Isaac, it's been months. Everyone's forgotten about it. Time for you to get over it, too. You have to get back in the game someday, kiddo. Don't you miss playing hockey? I play hockey, Dad. <laughs> A type of hockey where no one gets hurt and you can't break any bones. Uh -oh. If you screw up, it doesn't matter. Uh, no one knows it's you, and you don't even have to leave. Uh, uh, All right, so that is our little excerpt there. That was really good. Oh, my God, that was funny. My mic um, was muted. Sorry about that. That's okay. We're back I, online, right? Yes, you're back online. That goat was my favorite. Well, not sorry. The goat goat. The actual goat was my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he used to be a kid. Oh, it's just awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is the kind of humor that, that makes me happy in life. Yeah. So <laughs> writer. 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 So I feel Yeah, so I feel like um whether you're a hockey fan, which I'm sorry, I don't don't yell at me, but I'm not, but or an alien fan, you've got something in this story. So why why this story about hockey and aliens? Like that's not a natural is it a natural fit? I don't know. Uh, I don't think it is. Um, the story came about because I met with um, Erin O'Connor, our editor from Scholastic, and she asked me to pitch a book to her. And I didn't have anything uh, specific to pitch at the time, but she challenged me to write a hockey story because uh, apparently, Hockey books do really well for Scholastic. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm a much bigger basketball fan than I am a hockey fan, but I'm kind of a lapsed uh, Montreal Canadiens fan. Um, I come from a huge, I'm like a family of huge Montreal Canadiens fans. So it's I'm kind of a fan by osmosis. Um, so my thought was, well, what kind of graphic novel, uh, hockey-based graphic novel would I be interested in? What would make me want to pick it up uh, as a kid of 9, 10, 11, or 12? And the answer was aliens. So uh, it was only later that I realized that I was basically stealing the plot from Space Jam, but replacing hockey with, or basketball with hockey. Uh, but we're not going to have to talk about that. <laughs> I actually don't and see it. There's no but superstars either. There's no superstars, exactly. This was a very different. Yeah, it's plus not a, a regular kid. It's not a direct <laughs> ripoff, it's just a kind of sideways ripoff. There's <laughs> aliens and a sport. Yes, definitely yeah, aliens. There you go. <laughs> Can you tell us about Isaac and Lily? Because I think that relationship basically starting from like nothing because she's just moved here. Why did you choose to throw Lily in there as well? Oh, Lily. Um, well, first of all, Lily's loosely based on my niece, Serena, oh. who is supposed oh. to be watching this right now. And I hope she is. Hi, Serena. She, she goes down the list of favorites. Um, but it's funny because originally Serena, uh, sorry, you're not going to mess this up. Originally, um, Isaac was supposed to be the goaltender. He was loosely based on Carey Price of the Montreal Canadiens, who is my mom's, or was my late mom's, uh, all-time favorite hockey player. And somewhere along the way, I kind of switched things around. And because of that, we had to have uh, Lily come in, hitting the ground running. So we just kind of threw her in there and thought, well, let's make her, you know, someone who just moved in, doesn't want to really be there, uh, would rather be anywhere but this new neighborhood, this new school. And um, as they say, be careful what you wish for. Next thing you know, she's uh, abducted by aliens and forced to play hockey on, the, on an alien world. Yeah, that I think that was a brilliant move. Um, I mean, I, I love both characters, but Lily, I don't know, very much made me feel like I could be part of the story. I don't know, that's not just because she's female. I actually just think because she was a fish out of water and now a new fish out of water. And it was a very well, interesting angle. One of the things that I really like about Lily is that Isaac is struggling throughout the whole story without giving too much away to overcome the accident that we just saw in the reading um, and his decision to quit playing hockey. And 
she's she plays a big role in helping him, you know, find the courage to get back on the ice again. One of the things that I, one of the sort of traps that I wanted to avoid is making her a sidekick. So yeah. if, you look, yeah. if you look at this, she's very at, much not. She's very no, much not. She's almost, like, she's almost like his mentor. She's almost yeah. like yeah. Gandalf to her Frodo. You know, like she comes along. You think she's reluctant to to play along with uh, with Isaac, but she ends up being the catalyst to kind of push him forward. Yeah, I mean, she's almost the real hero of the story. <laughs> I, I would have been a Samwise. It was like Samwise and Frodo kind of thing, where they yes. kind of go back and forth, and you're not sure. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah I found her very compelling. I liked her. I mean, not that I didn't like. Yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. want to make Isaac feel bad. There, I like there Isaac. Is, uh, there's uh, a Lord of the Rings Easter egg in the book. If you know. I know. I'm not gonna oh, say. Okay, good. I'm not gonna say. <laughs> because I'm your kind of nerd. Just so you know, I'm fully your kind of nerd. Um, <laughs> So can you tell me who Emperor Mad Maroon is modeled after? Because I don't think I don't think I know who that is. Like I had several ideas of who Mad Maroon was supposed to be, like who he had hints of. Can you uh, tell me more about him? Yeah, Tim's going to talk about that, and as he talks, I'm going to pull up a uh, graphic mm -hmm. here. Share. Awesome. Somebody tell me if it's up because I can't. Not up yet. Uh, Tim, if you want to... Well, uh, basically, um, Mad Maroon, the way Jay wrote him in the script, uh, I mean, he's a villain in the story, but he's not, you know, a terrible villain. He's not like Lord Voldemort level uh, evil. Um, but he still is a bad guy. And of course, with, uh, with a villain, you want uh, the character to be interesting and engaging for uh, the readers uh, or the viewers or whatever the medium is. Um, uh, both the way you know the character acts and the way they look. So uh, in the script, Jay had written him as uh, the ruler of Galaxia. So he's obviously um, a character who has a lot of power and authority, uh, and he needed to be kind of frightening um, or intimidating. And uh, he's also greedy and selfish uh, with the hockey tax and wanting uh, to be entertained all the time uh, with hockey games. Uh, he's impulsive and he has kind of a mischievous quality to him um, that, that we see later on. I know we haven't seen much of him yet uh, in the reading that we just did. Um, anyway, we wanted to create a character who was scary, but not too scary uh, with like a, a little hint of uh, silliness, I guess. Uh, anyway, so this design that we see on the screen here is the first design that I came up with. Um, kind of like an insect lobster type horse face. I don't know exactly what I was doing there. But anyway, uh, we weren't too thrilled with that one. Um, so we kind of moved on. Although I, I do feel it kind of embodies the qualities that I just described, but I, I don't know, he's a little too weird looking. Um, he's like a dragon with Dr. Strange's collar. Yeah, yeah, there he, <laughs> exactly. Anyway, he's, I don't know, I, I feel like he, he looks okay, but I don't know. I, I don't think, uh, I mean, Jay and I weren't thrilled with that. So we, we kind of moved on to the next one. Um, I think this is actually the first one that I, I showed to the people at Scholastic. Um, so still kind of an insect, but a, a little bit, I don't know, cuter maybe. Um, yeah, the last for sure. There's a definite Bugs Life vibe going on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, it's hard to, to come up with anything original <laughs> these days. Uh, anyway, so uh, I, I think we weren't too thrilled uh, with, with this one either. Um, and then we moved on to something more humanoid, uh, which is kind of combining the insect with the, the humanoid look. Threw a cape on him to make him seem uh, more regal, I guess, uh, or like a cloak, like a, a royalty type thing. Um, still wasn't hitting the mark though so we moved on to the next one which was more humanoid uh a little goofy looking i think uh maybe too goofy looking for for what um we wanted for the story um but anyway we were kind of moving in the right direction i think so then we moved on to the next one uh and this is very similar to how he ends up looking um the one on the left, I don't know if people can see that clearly, but he's kind of got a Roman emperor vibe uh, happening. He's got the, the laurel wreath around his head and he has the, the cloak. Um, 
And then the one on the right uh, was sort of a, I don't know, cyborg, futuristic, alien type thing, which, uh, I don't know, I, I was okay with these, but I, I still, we wanted to push a little bit further for something else. And we ended up with the next one, which is uh, his final design. And so we kind of kept some of the elements of the Roman emperor uh, from the, the last slide. Um, and he's got the purple coloring, which is also kind of a royal color, uh, since he's uh, supposed to be, uh, you know, a king, emperor type character. Uh, and uh, we combined it with the sort of sporty look that he has. He's got shoulder pads, uh, elbow pads, shin pads, um, which emphasizes his look uh, or his love of hockey. Uh, and then as for his his head, I mean, I kind of just went with a stereotypical alien bald egg shaped head <laughs> with pointy ears that we've probably seen a million times in science fiction before. Uh, and I tried to capture some sort of a, some sort of the, the, the silly mischievous quality in his face. So he's, he's a bad guy, but he's not, he's not a terrible bad guy. <laughs> he's a bad <laughs> guy that you, you, you love Thanos to. level, not Thanos level. Yes, exactly. Um, I now rate all bad guys against Thanos, um, yeah. <laughs> which makes sense. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to write with two people? I've never done it myself, but I have friends who've done it. Can you tell us what's that? What's that's like? Uh, to collab, I mean, collaborate. Like, collaborate with two people that are going to make one book right. together. Uh, I mean, it's the it's the only way I know um, since I don't illustrate, and since you obviously need an artist for the comic books. Um, so I, I don't know. It, it's, I love it. It's it's a, a great way to collaborate. As somebody who's read comics all their life, all their life, their entire life. Yes, you right. And, you may uh, have many lives. We just don't know them yes, all. Uh, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, I tried drawing at one point, and just really not very good at it. So I decided to focus on the writing part and uh, partner up with different artists. Tim being one of the very first. Uh, we've actually known each other since grade eleven. Wow. Yeah, we're in yeah, high school. Our senior, re senior year in high school in Montreal. A couple of years ago. Cool. 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 Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Not that large. <laughs> so, I mean, I love it. I mean, it's like, you know, you write the script, you hand it over to uh, the artist, and then it's like Christmas. You wait for all this wonderful artwork to come into your inbox every week or every month. and. You know, you see your story coming to life. It's great. But how does that work? Like, just from a practical level for people who don't create graphic novels, and by the way, want to, if anybody's watching and wants to help me do that, um, do you, like, write a script and then you like, this part's the part that needs visuals? Like, is it yes. that explicit? Yeah? Yes, oh. I will show you. Um, what we tend to do, uh, we mo whoops, that's not really what most people tend to do in comics uh, is work from a script, uh, what we call a full script. And it looks, you know, if you've ever... Um, read a play or seen a screenplay, it's pretty much the same thing. So I will bring that so up. It's all dialogue and then it's, well, it's broken. And dialogue. Right. Yeah, it's broken down usually page by page and panel by panel. So it'll say panel one, you know, such and such. Well, there you go. Oh, wow. Yeah, so basically, this is um, this was actually done in a screenwriting program. And instead of scenes, it's broken down by pages and panels instead of, you know, shots. And usually what happens is instead of uh, having direction for the camera or for the actor, you have direction for the art. So basically it's art direction. And then mm -hmm. you have the dialogue uh, the way you would in a screenplay or a stage play. Um, and that's it. So the artist would basically take this page, which would have, if you count, one, two, three, four panels. And that's just a suggestion. Um, mm -hmm. He or she may want to break it down slightly differently. And then it describes, you know, panel one, this is a flashback to the big game. And this is what needs to be in that panel and see the narrator dialogue or text that's in that panel as well. And you move down to panel two, same thing, direction for the artist to draw, plus the two characters that are speaking, and it goes from there. So for every page of comic book, you've got roughly a page of script, sometimes two pages. So it's like the screenplay rule, you know, one page to one minute. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so you produce the script like this uh, after many edits and um, corrections and Direction from, uh, from your editor, it goes to the artist, and they, they take it and make magic out of it. I almost think of it like a, uh, it's almost like there's a screenwriter, like if, if this was a TV show or a movie, there's a screenwriter, which would be Jay, and then I'm the actors, and then we're kind of both 
co-directors, I guess. Like Jay tells me how the scene should look and then I I guess I decide, you know, what camera angle to use and that sort of thing. So And then if yeah. it works, you do it that way. But if it's not, you go back to Jay and you're like, hey, I'd like this better. Right? Yeah, or I just do <laughs> my own thing. <laughs> Jay has to live with what I come up with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's totally different with every uh, with every artist. I mean, some projects yes, it is. It is. some projects you hand the script in and you don't see anything until it's done when the artist is done. It also right. depends on how the editor likes to work. Right. Yeah. Other projects. I mean, I had artists that I've worked with who call me every other day. <laughs> okay. Are you okay if I do this? Can I change that? You know, wow. which is fine. I mean, I, I'm, I'm lonely, so it's nice to have <laughs> contact now and then. You know, I mean, you guys know it's what we do is very solitary, so it's nice to hear. It is. People. Right. Uh, yeah. So everyone's different. Every project is different, uh, but mostly, you know, it works out to be a lovely kind of collaboration. So what's yeah. happening next with a uh, little, I don't want to give it away, but what happens next with Isaac and Lily? Like, are, is there another story coming? Is uh, We've talked about it, but there's nothing, you know, set in stone yet. Really? But there are hints in the I feel story. like, yeah, exactly. I feel like there, there are, there are the moments. As to what may happen next. So let me I'm going to send you guys an email because I know what happens next or what I want to happen next. I will send you. <laughs> yeah, the book's not out until October 6th, so not very many people have read it yet. Um, so I'm really uh, excited to see what people say and if it warrants a sequel. I mean, I'm there. It, I don't know about 11, but I'm It there. 100% warrants a sequel, people. Like, if anyone's listening that is in the decision-making space, it 100% warrants a sequel. I hope our editors are listening. You better be listening. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the best way to get a hold of this book is lmno.ca. Is that correct? People can get a copy from them? I believe so. Okay. Yes. yes, yes, that is lmno.ca. And if nothing Spanish. else, they can always get it from Scholastic. Yes, it's going to be part of the book club. Um, I'm not sure how book clubs are going to be working in the, in the days of COVID. Uh, but I think it's all virtual and you can order directly instead of going through your teacher. That is super and, exciting. you know, the usual suspects, uh, Amazon... Uh, chapter etc but please you know check out your local um independent bookstores book store your local comic book shop if they can bring it in oh uh, silver snail in toronto. toronto absolutely yes. i'm going to show people where to follow yous this is where to follow <laughs> yous <laughs> it's very yeah. high tech do you like my artistry it's beautiful <laughs> yeah it's great yeah i'm, I'm jay torres comics on all across as they say across all social media platforms that's right except tiktok i don't do tiktok not yet <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. So, Jay Charles comments on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Insta. I don't know what else is out there. All of them. Yes, everyone go follow because if you want to find out more about this book and others, that's the best way to stay in touch with these two humans. Uh, yes, please. And Elemento to get your books or your local independent bookstore would be great. Anything else you can tell us about the process, guys, before I let you go? Anything else you definitely didn't tell me and you want to tell me now? Well, I don't know how much time you have. Uh, well, actually, I do know how much time you have. <laughs> I know how much you're scheduled for. Well, I I have a step-by-step -step process showing the creation of the first page. So Jay Ooh. just showed us the script. Um, yes, and uh, I think he also might be able to share yes. uh, the various stages that I go through when I create the page, if that's of interest. The behind the scenes. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, exactly. Sort of a... See, like in the final minutes of this thing, I get used to the program. <laughs> Can you see it? Not yet. No. Yeah. Oh, there it is. It's coming. Yep. Oh, okay. Right. There's a bit of delay, I think. So. Technically, the first this is not the first step. The first step is I print the script out on paper, and in the margins of the paper, I actually do little doodles um, of each panel, like tiny little thumbnail drawings that I think uh, will, you know, be the best way to represent what he's written. Uh, anyway, once I sort of have a general sense of how to draw the scene, um, I do the penciling stage, which is what you see here. Um, and Does pencil literally have, mean pencils? Like actual pencils? Well, I, <laughs> I'm still in the dark ages. I still use pencils, and then I, I scan them and then do all, everything else from that point on uh, on the computer. Uh, but yeah, I haven't I haven't fully um, made no, but that's switch. cool. 
That's digital, cool. digital, yeah. But, but yeah, it's still called pencils, even though a lot of artists nowadays use, um, you know, tablets and whatnot to draw. Um, anyway, so I would usually at this stage send what you see in front of you to the editor and to Jay, uh, and not one page at a time, but I would send, you know, a bunch of pencil pages and then I would say, okay, how does this look? And if anybody has any suggestions, obviously this is the time to tell me because I can ch make changes easily. Um, more so in, in this stage than later on when it's fully colored. So then after that, the next stage is inking, which basically, again, it's, a, it's an old fashioned artistic term uh, where you take black ink and you go over the pencil lines. And the reason for that is so that they you know, are, are bolder and easier to see, especially in the printing process, uh, if it's a printed book. Um, and then uh, the next step is, uh, I just, it's the same as the last, but I just added in the black uh, areas, which traditionally would be done by filling it in with, you know, India ink or something, but I, I just fill it in on Photoshop because it's obviously a lot faster. Um, and then you might notice there that the ice surface uh, behind Isaac or underneath Isaac and, and the players is blank and i did that i made that decision early on which i i was i'm happy with the result but it took a lot of time basically i what i i knew that it, in the coloring stage it would be a real pain to have to color the uh, lines on the ice uh, around all the players especially when there are a lot of players uh, on the ice at the same time i just having colored things in the past i knew that that would be a pain so i put them on a separate layer which uh, i think is the next slide Oh, no, it's not. Sorry. Uh, we'll get to that. But anyway, if Jay wants to just maybe go back to the previous one for a sec. Anyway, yeah, so there it is, fully colored, but without the, the ice surface. Um, and then the next one, uh, on a separate layer in Photoshop, uh, I, I color all the lines, uh, and it's much faster to just do it this way. And then I merge it all together, which is the next slide. So now... Oh, cool. Yeah, it was, yeah, as I say, it's an extra step and it took more time, but I feel like it, uh, it just made, it made it look a little more realistic, I think, that to have the ice surface, you know, fully rendered underneath the characters. Uh, anyway, so then that's, that would be the full colored uh, page. And then after that, uh, the letters are added on, uh, on a separate layer. And that's it. That's the final, final stuff. That is really cool to see behind the scenes. I've never seen that before. That's so cool. Really, that's cool. Well, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. You learn something every day. There you are. Yeah. All right, people. Planet Hockey. Go get it. There, there it is right there. And follow these peoples. Follow the peoples. All well, right. I'm going to. French. Oh, in French as well. Oh, yeah, that's wow. true. French okay. too. There you go. Wicked cool. All righty, people. Great. I'm going to say goodbye. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for chatting with us, Angela. Thank you, Angela. Oh, thank no you problem. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Angela, Tim, and Jay, for these wonderful discussions, as well as to Andrea and Michael. It's been a lovely afternoon. Um, and Angela, you were a great host. I'm <laughs> looking forward uh, to the second book in your Pickle vs. Zombie uh, book, clearly, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's been a lovely afternoon. And yeah, Angela will be uh, coming back on screen at 2.30 for our teen programming, which should be super exciting. Talking about people, talking about Miss Danny Jansen. Oh, and yeah. And I'll be talking to, there, Under Shifting Stars. Come back for us. Yes, please do. All right, so we will take be taking a short break and we'll be back, 2.30. Bye.
Hello everyone and welcome back to the Kids and Teens stream. We are excited to reintroduce our host for the rest of the teen portion of the stream, Angela Misri. Angela Misri is an award-winning award -willing journalist, author, and educator. Her detective series called The Portia Adams Adventures is set in the 1930s, and her first middle grade series is called Tales of the Apocalypse. In, in the first book, Pickles vs. the Zombies, was published by the Cormorant, Cormorant Books in 2019. The second book in the series is called Trip of the Dead, and it will be out in spring of 2021, so make sure you look out for that. So let's welcome back Angela. Hello, hello. Hi, Angela. I'm just going to let you take it over for now. Thank you, Aisha. And just so you know, I am award winning and also award willing if anyone wants to give me any awards. I'm fully <laughs> up. Uh, everyone, if you're listening, stay award tuned. Award willing, that. exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much, Aisha. So I'm really excited to be able to invite up our next guest who's going to be talking about the year Shakespeare ruined my life. This is going to be Danny Jansen. Danny, please join us. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Awesome. Um, my name is pronounced Denis because Denis. I decided that uh, it would look like Danny, but be pronounced Denis, so. <laughs> okay, Denis it is, very good, thank you for that. Um, so Denis Jansen is a teacher and writer who lives in Montreal. Um, she should probably also be ashamed to tell people that she named her cats after punctuation symbols, ampersand and m dash, oi, in case you're curious. Despite that, despite that, I'm going to ask her to read from her book, The Year, um, the Year Shakespeare Ruined My Life. So, Denise, take it away. Thanks. All right. In order to understand what I'm about to read, you need to know a, a few things about the book. Yep. The, the first is that Allison is the main character, and the thing she wants most in this world is to become valedictorian. She thinks that this is the, the path for her. And in order to make this happen, she's agreed to produce the school play, which is A Midsummer Night's Dream. Problem is she has no clue what she's doing and she keeps getting things wrong. <laughs> uh, at one point she does something that makes her best friend very angry with her. I won't reveal what, but at this point her best friend is not talking to her and uh, Allison does not want to leave things this way for a number of reasons. They're best friends. They've known each other forever. She loves her friend. She also needs her help to produce the school play. So Allison has decided she's got a solution uh, to the problem. The other thing you need to know is her best friend is named Becca and Becca's prized possession is Harvey the Honda. A very old car, doesn't even have the fancy things that we hook our phones into any now it's like just an, a cd player it's her first car first car yep harvey the honda got and it also maybe not the safest driver usually <laughs> okay i swung open the scarred metal doors to the parking lot and stood there scanning the cars until i spotted the familiar aged blue honda Taking long strides to the car, I kept from running by reminding myself that many of the people in this parking lot were still learning to drive and that the rest of them might have a reason at the end of a long day to want to run over a teenager. I was in luck. Harvey was empty. I patted him affectionately and scooched myself up onto his hood. The metal was uncomfortably warm after a full day in the sun, but I didn't budge. I noticed Becca's curly hair as she came out of the double doors. She walked toward Harvey, head bent over the phone in her hand. If we were on speaking terms, I would have warned her not to walk in text in a school parking lot, but we weren't. And I needed another minute to steal myself. I knew the moment she saw me. Her pace slowed and she tucked her phone into her back pocket. As she drew closer, I debated whether I should be the first one to say something or not. When Becca was eye level with me and only about three feet from the car, I opened my mouth to speak, but Becca walked right past me. I didn't turn, but heard her unlock the driver's side door. I heard some squeaking as she opened it and sat down. Then I felt and heard the door slam shut. I chanced a glance over my shoulder. Becca was glowering through the windshield. Becca, we need to talk, I started but my voice was drowned out by the combination of Harvey's old motor turning over and a Coldplay song blasting on the stereo. 
Becca glared at me some more. I held her gaze, hoping she'd see my resolve and my apology. She revved the engine. It was a warning. I looked forward, but I didn't move. Becca revved the engine again. I scrabbled at the hood with my fingers, but there was nothing to hold on to. I heard the engine shift into drive and closed my eyes. The car gently edged forward and my stomach turned. I was unmoored. Harvey eased into a turn and I slid a little along his hood. I tensed my legs, trying desperately to find purchase. The car stopped and I heard a window creak open. I looked back. Becca stuck her head out of the driver's window and said to me, get off Harvey now. I was too nervous to peek, speak, so I just shook my head. Your choice, Becca said. I gulped. Becca picked up speed. A steady speed meant I could maintain my balance on the hood. It felt almost exhilarating. The car wasn't moving at a speed that could be described as creating a breeze, but I did feel fresh air waft by my face. <laughs> Becca saw that this tactic wasn't working and started to swerve in big, terrifying loops. I slid from one end of the hood to the other. I thought I might throw up. Becca braked, not as suddenly as she usually did. It was comforting to know that my best friend didn't actually want to kill me. I looked back and she stuck her head out the window again. Allison, get the hell off my car, she yelled. Ladies, is there a problem? Neither of us had noticed the vice principal approaching. Nervous as I was, I jumped, then tried to cover it up casually by crossing my legs. Yep, I sit on moving cars all the time. Nothing to see here, Mr. Patel. Becca turned off the music and answered tersely, nope. I shook my head and smiled. Is that so, he asked. He swung his heavy key ring around his pointer finger three times, then said, might I suggest that you ride inside the car then, Allison? I was thrilled that the vice principal knew my name. I'd never been sent to the office or suspended, so why did he know my name? Maybe because it came up in conversation with teachers. Maybe as a potential candidate for valedictorian. <laughs> but then I remembered he was reprimanding me for joyriding on the hood of my friend's car, and I jumped down. I chuckled, pretending we were all in on a joke, and walked to the passenger side door. I yanked on the handle, but nothing happened. I yanked a second time. It was locked. I chuckled again, but Mr. Patel's face remained completely impassive. I looked in through the closed window at Becca. She was staring straight forward. I tapped on the window, and when she finally looked at me, I nodded my head in the direction of the vice principal. Nothing happened for what felt like an eternity, and I started to panic that Becca was so mad at me She'd chance a suspension just to keep me out of her car. Then I heard a click and clambered into Harvey before Becca could change her mind. I was careful to buckle up since Mr. Patel was still staring at us. I gave him a little wave and off we went. I waited until he was in his own car and off he went, sorry. I waited until he was in his own car before saying to Becca, want me to get out? My voice was small. I was about to repeat myself when Harvey started forward. I smiled. Oh my God. So I was gonna ask you this question about the whole book, but now I have to know about this scene. How often have you ridden on the cover, on the, on the sorry, on the hood of a car? Uh, so I grew up in, in rural Nova Scotia and you make your own fun when you grow up in the buildings. <laughs> so yeah, a few times, yeah. 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 Never, that was way too well written. But, that was not an imagination. That that felt very real. <laughs> yeah, that that's happened. There, my sister also liked to play a game of um, saying, like saying, "Come get into the car," and then she would slowly drive forward as you were putting your hand on the, the handle, and then she'd stop, and you'd try to get in, and then she'd drive forward. So, yeah. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah. Older sister. Younger. Ah. Oh. Okay. See, I have a younger sister too. They're trouble. I'm just saying. Um, so when I write my books, uh, my Portia Adams books, I very much have people in mind when I'm writing them. So I wanted to ask you who you have in mind when you write your main characters. Uh, a mixture of people. Um, mm. So the best friend in the book is, does remind me a lot of my best friend from high school. Right. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, very no nonsense. Mm -hmm. 
you know, not up for any kind of, well, up for fun, but not up for foolishness. No shenanigans. Got it. Yeah. Um, the main character certainly has aspects of me. Yeah. Um, I agreed not because I wanted to be valedictorian. Uh, that was a popularity vote in my high school. Yeah. Um, I didn't, so I knew I didn't have a chance. <laughs> Good for bad, you don't have a chance. Moving yeah, on. It's, it's popularity votes, you know, it, it it went to the, you know, one of the very, very popular people. Right. Uh, but I, I did agree to produce our school play in grade oh. 12. And at least I'd had some experience in theater, unlike Allison, but I certainly didn't have enough to know how to get money and uh, design props. And there were just, I learned a lot of things that year. Uh, mm -hmm also stressful. And then also I saw, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher and I work with students and I've seen these perfectionist students who hold themselves to standards that nobody else expects of them. Um, and I was really inspired to write about someone who, who has that, who's, who's just holds herself up to these unrealistic expectations and doesn't realize how much People admire her just for the the gutsiness she has to try the things she does. Um, and then the little sister's a bit like my little sister. <laughs> <laughs> we write from what we know, right? We write from what we know. Yeah. Um, I my one of the funniest things before I started reading your book when it you know the year Shakespeare ruined my life. I'm thinking, what year didn't Shakespeare ruin my life? There's a lot of years in there. <laughs> so, um, why did you choose that she would produce Midsummer Night's Dream out of all the Shakespeare's that could ruin your life? Why that one? Well, it is one of the probably the most produced uh, Shakespeare play in high school because mm. it's considered more fun. Uh, so that's kind of a practical reason. It seemed realistic, but right. also there's a play within the play. Okay. Um, yeah. And it's a pretty disastrous. <laughs> yes, it is. Everything goes wrong. Play. Everything goes wrong. Like they end up, you know, one of them ends up being turned into an actual donkey. donkey. Yeah. Uh, so that's what's happening in the book is that this play is just keeps going wrong. <laughs> uh, so there was that. And also the, the, the idea of love triangles that like she loves him and he loves her, which is one of Shakespeare's favorite things to do in a comedy is part of what's going on in the book too. But it spins it on its heel. I mean, there's a lot about like general teen life that I think every single human, I don't care what generation you're in will recognize, but it also spins that, you know, the triangle of he likes her and she likes him and blah, 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 blah. Can you talk a little bit about those relationships and if that was from the beginning your plan or if it just kind of came out of the story writing? Um, it came pretty early on, but it, I can't say right away I was like, you know what, this is going to be a story where he likes her, but she likes her. Yeah. Um, it, it, what I was doing at the time was I was working with my school's Gay Straight Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, and what they, the, some of the, I mean, some of the most interesting conversations you can listen into as an adult uh, happen out, you know, during extracurriculars, I find. And the students were talking about how they, you know, I live in Montreal, we're a pretty open city in terms of mm -hmm. accepting of sexuality uh, and gender differences. And so they had this experience of being in a school where they knew they were supported. Right. For the most part, you know, you can never account for everybody. But they knew it was a supportive school. They were coming from supportive homes. They had friends and family who were out, but there was still this, you know, this weirdness around. Ah, oh, but I still have to come out. That's still on me as a as somebody who's not part of heteronormative culture. That I have to be the one to come out, not everyone else. Friends, yeah. 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 Um, and so those conversations were so thought provoking to me that. Um, this generation is really, their their experience of coming out is so, I mean, is it a, I'm sure as it has been, but it's so varied. And, and they were sometimes talking about how having books that only show coming out as potentially disastrous for a character didn't, made them feel almost guilty. <laughs> wow. that, that like they didn't, it wasn't hard. It wasn't painful for them or like they didn't think they were going to be kicked out of the house made them almost feel strangely like they didn't deserve that. Yeah, and like that, because other people have gone through worse and then you're like, why didn't I? And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that was that was the other thing that really made me want to take explore that and take that into the book. 
it felt really real for me for when, uh, well, because it built up nicely and then it, it, it resolved very nicely. I'm not going to tell anyone what happens. But um, <laughs> but I felt like it was very natural and it wasn't like a focus of the story. Not, none of it was the focus. It's not the Shakespeare play or the valedictorian thing or the best friend thing or none of it was the focus. But there were so many things happening that flowed together nicely that by the end you're like, wow, there's a lot of things that I've just, you know, gone through. And that is very much like teenage life, right? Yeah, no, there, I mean, you're not never going through just one thing when yeah. you're a teenager. Yeah. Um, I sometimes watch what's going on in my students' lives and I'm just exhausted seeing it. <laughs> I'm not living it, but um, it's it's a lot. Yeah, you're, you're trying to get in. Things are very competitive these days. Um, the, I think students feel way more pressure than ever before. Young people feel more pressure than ever before to stand out in a group, um, to, to have that application that, gets them where they want where to go. They want to go. Yeah. Um, and then there's the friend stuff is stuff is more complicated than other ever with social media. I'm going to sound like an old person, but you know, well, it, I do think their lives and, and they're always, you know, they're so busy with so many interesting ECAs and things that I didn't even, you know, weren't even part of extracurriculars. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. Extracurriculars. And so I, I, you know, I think that that's just part of, being a teenager, figuring out friendships, figuring out romantic relationships, if that's what you're into, figuring out yourself, um, and then still trying to study for your math test. <laughs> still trying to get your homework done. So it's interesting, when I was writing Pickles versus the Zombies, um, so I wrote the book and Pickles is the cat in this character in this story and she's got the point of view and she's a she's a lady cat and she falls in love with another lady cat and um, people got to the end of the book and uh, we're shocked that they were both women, lady cats, sorry, women, both lady cats. Like I didn't emphasize it, but they were shocked that there was a lesbian couple of <laughs> lady cats in my fictional book about zombies. Um, <laughs> just so we're, yeah. Um, yeah. That seems like the most shocking part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's zombies people. <laughs> this was such a minor part of it that she fell in love with a lady cat. Um, and you don't even know if all cats are gay. Who knows? Nobody knows these things. But the point is I was trying to make for, for your question was, what has the reception been like for the fact that this storyline doesn't follow what the heteronormative group of um, publishers would have had us publish even 10 years ago? How's the reception been? Uh, so far, pretty mm -hmm. positive. Um, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, exactly. One never knows. Um, yep. You know, like my publisher, Second Story Press, is, they're very... They're, they they call themselves a feminist press. They are interested in marginalized voices. Yeah. So, you know, I think that was a great fit. And I also think that was part of what they wanted to be able to do. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of young people I've spoken to, it they've, you know, they've said that it is nice to have a not depressing story um, for many reasons. Also because, <laughs> you know, hard times right now that we're living through. You know, and then, and then there's some people who, it, you know, maybe it doesn't ring true for because their experience was more difficult or just different. And you know, that's going to happen. But so far, I haven't had any backlash. No, I, I, but, right on the cover, there's a rainbow pin, so I think people know. Like, there's at least the, some. A lot of people are going to. It's uh, not a hidden thing. Yes. It's right yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, my um, first readers when we were when I was workshopping it would get to the point where she said out. I'm yeah. lesbian and we're like oh, <laughs> oh yeah that makes sense um, but you know like it's it's more obvious if you've seen the cover and and read read the back so <laughs> and we want this to be so much more normal right like we want the mainstream to be more than just what it used to be and this is an important part of that I think it's a powerful way to tell a story about a time of life. So can you tell me a little bit about why you chose to write it in this period of someone's life? Why YA? Uh, because I'm around young people so much. Uh, you teach grade? Sorry? I teach, <laughs> I've taught everything from grade seven to grade 11. Wow. Uh, because in Quebec, that's high school. Got it. Um, and uh, I, I do think there's an extra pressure for those perfectionists in their graduating year. So that's why she's graduating because I did see those students who all along were putting too much pressure on themselves, like just spin out during the graduating year because yep. it's more competitive. Yep. Um, and I love reading YA. I think that 
there's so much, I think that YA lately has been pushing boundaries in so many great ways. Like I see so many more, you know, I've read more trans books, like books that are written by trans authors about trans characters in YA than any other genre right now. And so I think it's a great opportunity to get them while they're young, yeah. <laughs> open doors. And I see my students too, like being open to reading, um, you know, it used to be when I would put queer books on the reading lists that a few students would Ooh. read it. And usually kids who identified as being LGBTQ+. Sure. And now, like, if it's a good story, they just, they'll read it. And I think that's great that it's not just, a, it's not being such a niche anymore. Yeah, absolutely true. Um, a great story is a great story. And this is a great story. Like, not even just on, I'm a very character based, like when I read, I love like really great characters that feel like they could be like sitting next to me. I totally felt that all the way through the story. Like I cringe when I was supposed to cringe and I was like, yeah, it was like perfectly written that way. So how, how, when you work with your editors, how do you work back and forth on that? Is it like, are you a 17 draft person? Are you a five draft person? How does that work? Uh, I ran out of counts of how many drafts. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, and then particular chapters had even more drafts right. uh, than others, like the ending. And um, yeah, so I definitely many drafts. That's me. Do you, um, do you editor, write more than they want or do they keep asking for more? Uh, they wanted a little more. Mm. But um, I, I had cut a fair bit. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the the hardest part of editing that that you have to do is to learn to cut and yep. to let go of the darlings. Yeah, your darlings, <laughs> it's the thing. We're not uh, exaggerating when we say that, people. It's a real thing. <laughs> oh, it's the hard. You know, I I tell all my students, I have this, and I encourage them to do this. Like, have a folder. Yeah. Where you put all the things that you love that you can't keep, and maybe you'll lose it. You'll use it later, but at least you feel like you haven't deleted it into nothingness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I totally get that. I have notebooks full of stuff that I've crossed out and it's just sitting on my sh on my shelf. I think that's really important. So I'm going to tell people, well, first I'm going to ask you, Dan Danae, um, is there another story with this group of humans? Not right now. Okay. So if people want to get a hold of it, Elemino is their best choice. Elemino.ca is, um, has all the books for today that we're talking about, but also your independent bookstores. Is it actually out in stores right now, Danae? It came out Tuesday. Oh, congratulations. Happy book birthday. Thank you. It's awesome. It's a strange year to be, you know, having a book birthday. But uh, yeah, it's it's available as of now. And um, as always, yeah, local small bookstores, they need our love. <laughs> they need our love, especially now. And I'm going to tell you to all follow Danae. It's Danae A. -A Jansen, Jansen, J A N S E N on Twitter, just to keep up with her and find out what she's doing, if she's doing any events for you guys. Um, yeah, so that was pretty much all my questions. Did you have anything I didn't get into, Danae? Honestly, not that I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I can, like log off and be like, oh. That's... Did you do a launch or are you doing a launch? Uh, I kind of did a launch at my school. Okay. With, with uh, yeah, we did a launch at my school because it was the, only way to do it in person because we're kind of all isolated together and we could distance outside and be safe. Right. And I really was hoping for to do something in person, which was really nice. And okay. that's great. Uh, my parents were very kind about it, which was I was grateful for. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, shout out to your students and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to pitch us back out um, to our wonderful Word on the Street sponsors. Uh, thanks very much, Danae. Thank you so much. Nice to talk to you.
Hello, hello. Um, I'm getting ready to talk to Alexandra Latos, which is pretty exciting because she wrote Under Shifting Stars. So we are going to talk to her right now, Miss Alexandra. Hi, I'm hello. Alexandra Latos. This How are you? Under Shifting Stars. Under Shifting Stars. <laughs> Um, so you live with your husband and young children in Alberta. I'm from Calgary. Where are you in Alberta? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm from Calgary as well. Nice. And, yeah, um, I have a husband and three kids. Um, and this is your first YA book? Yes. I wrote oh. a new adult book under Lexi Baker, but this is my very first YA. That's super exciting. So um, are you ready to give us a bit of a reading? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So um, just to give you context before I read, yes, um, please. the novel is told in dual point of view with alternating chapters. And I'm going to read a chapter from Claire's point of view. And um, to tell you a bit about the, what the book is about beforehand. OK, so yes, please. it's the story of twin sisters whose relationship fell apart after their older brother, Adam, died. Um, Audrey, who's neurodiverse, is attending a private school and wants to return to her public school with um, Claire. Claire doesn't want Audrey to return because she blames her for their brother's death. So um, the beginning of the novel, Claire is very angry at Audrey in the world. So she doesn't treat Audrey very well. Um, over the course of the novel, she grows and I think becomes a happier person once she embraces her true self. So, we'll begin. Okay. The next morning, I wake up to mom banging on my door. It's always the same routine every school day. My alarm goes off, I hit snooze after snooze until mom eventually bangs on my door and yells at me through the wood that I'm going to be late. She doesn't understand I'm a normal teenager because Audrey wakes up at 7 a.m. every single morning. The first thing mom says when I walk into the kitchen, you're not wearing that to school. I feel my entire body tense and grip the handle of my bag tighter. What's that supposed to mean? Let's start with the shorts. Everyone wears these shorts. Mom leans back against the kitchen sink and crosses her arms. Rip shorts with the pockets hanging out? I doubt it. I plaster on my fakest sweet smile. Well, maybe when you drop me off at school, you can take a moment to look around a bit. It's meant to be a jab. Mom has spent the entire semester focusing on everything Audrey talking to Audrey's teachers and making sure Audrey's doing okay. She's always worried about Audrey doing okay, as if she's afraid Audrey is somehow gonna get worse. Mom mimics my fake pleasant smile. Well, things might be changing, then I can keep an eye on both my girls again. She glances over at Audrey, who's wearing a sweater mom knitted for her and baggy jeans and staring at the back of the cereal box. Her mouth is moving slowly, but no words are coming out. She's probably trying to read the French. Mom looks back at me and frowns. You're wearing too much eye makeup. Seriously? All right, so when people say Audrey and I look nothing alike, it's because she's the pretty one. Like mom, Audrey is super cute with her large blue eyes, long eyelashes, and thick dark curl. I'm gangly with thin blonde hair to match and small brown eyes you can barely see without liner. But that's not why I'm wearing it. I'm wearing it because it's my war mask. Yeah, another glance at Audrey. You should dress more age appropriate. Now it's taking all my energy not to flip out. Audrey can't even wear buttons. The thought that the buttons on her coat might not be spaced exactly the same distance apart triggers a panic attack, so mom can only buy her coats with zippers. When Audrey gets up and leaves the kitchen, I let out an exasperated breath, letting my eyes roll back in my head. Are you actually telling me that I have to change to fit in with Audrey? This has nothing to do with Audrey. That was a lie. Everything has to do with Audrey. She probably won't wear makeup until, well, ever. The moment I say it, I realize how ridiculous I sound. I was implying that she's immature, but really she'll never wear it because she doesn't need it. Ah, I scream and stomp out of the kitchen. Upstairs in my room, I open up drawers and yank clothes out, drop them on the floor. I'm trying to make a mess for mom, but if she calls me out, I'll say I was stressed finding a new outfit. I toss the shorts into the corner, then pull on the jeans version of my shorts, but with even bigger holes. Ha! The joke's on mom. The joke's on everyone. Because that girl downstairs, the one who yelled about wanting to be like every other teenage girl, she doesn't really exist. She's a role in the movie of my life. I've gotten pretty good at playing her, too. But if that version still isn't good enough for mom, I might as well show her the real me. So I change into the clothes I actually want to wear, rather than the ones I wear to look like every other girl. I peel off my sheer black shirt and replace it with a black zip-up sweatshirt over my tank. Mom hates this sweatshirt. She hated it when Adam wore it, said it made him look like a lowlife. It has a skeleton tree on the back. He gave it to me years ago after he grew out of it. I wipe the majority of the eyeliner off, but slip the pencil in my pocket. My hands are shaking and I have to ball them into fists as I go back downstairs. I'm so angry. I felt angry for so long, I can't even remember what it feels like to not feel angry, to not want to break the world around me, rip the sky into pieces, and toss them back again. Kyle thinks everything I feel is completely normal. He claims anger is one of the stages of grief, 
And that's why I'm laying unwarranted blame, unwarranted blame on Audrey. Whatever, dude. When I enter the kitchen again, Audrey's climbing into the car. Mom pauses halfway out the door and her eyes widen when she sees me. I grab an apple from the bowl on the counter and take a bite. My eyes locked on hers as I silently dare her to say something about this outfit too. If she does, I'll throw back that nothing will make her happy. Instead, she turns away and says, your lunch is on the counter. Audrey's in the front seat and I'm in the back. It's always like that with the three of us now. When we were little, we used to fight over who had shotgun. Now we climb into our usual seats and no one suggests we do anything different. Mom is probably relieved she doesn't even have to talk to me. I don't know if the two of them talk either because I put on my headphones and stare out the window the entire drive. I suppose I have to get to how it happened. It's not enough to say Adam died, even though that's all I've been able to tell anyone who asks. If they push, I might be able to add car accident. A few months before Adam died, the rents decided to send Audrey to a shrink. She was always in her head and disrupting class. She wasn't growing out of the behavior like they'd hoped. Dr. Jackson tossed around a bunch of theories, including attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and autism spectrum disorder before deciding he needed to spend more time with Audrey in order to settle on a diagnosis. Then one day he suggested she try more extracurricular, extracurricular activities. She wasn't any good at sports and T-Rex was a better ballerina. She wanted to try karate. So mom bought her a karate gi and a white belt and they dropped her off at her first class and went out for dinner. About 15 minutes into the class, the host phone rang. It was Audrey. The collar of her gi was rubbing the back of her neck. She wanted to come home. Adam didn't want to interrupt mom and dad's date night, so he said he'd pick her up. I told him not to and to make Audrey deal, but he wouldn't listen to me. He said he had his new car and he was happy for an excuse to drive. He never made it there. Well, I got to say that, first of all, I have to say that every single teenage girl I know, including me, has had that scene yeah. with their mother. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I don't care what you're wearing. I don't care what culture you're in. We've all had that scene. Oi, mamas. And now I'm a mom, so I probably do the same thing. Um, you deal with a lot of grief and loss really eloquently in this story. Can you tell us how you, you. approached um, it and how you navigated it? I think it? I was writing a bit from personal experience um, because in the three years before I started writing Under Shifting Stars, I lost three mem um, family members who were very close to me. And so it was a pretty rough time. Um, probably the the one that hit me the hardest was my mother-in-law, Karen, just because she died so suddenly. And it was a, such a shock that you could see somebody one day and they were gone the next and never be able to talk to them again. So I kind of explored that idea with both Audrey and Claire. Um, Audrey blames herself for Adam's death and actually holds on to his ghost, seeing him in the basement. And at one point she tries to apologize to him. And Claire hangs out in the basement where she and Adam used to play Nintendo, trying to feel closer with, again, with them again and even pulls out a Ouija board to try to communicate with him. Um, I also tried to use a lot of flashbacks in the narrative um, of the memories of Adam to give the reader a sense of who he was when he was alive so that he wasn't just a name in the book. And I wanted the reader to recognize what a good person he was, how important he was to everybody in the family, and so they, that they would grieve him as well. But I also felt like he was imperfect. He wasn't like a like a, some sort of like put on a pedestal, right? No. Like in the flashbacks, I still feel like he's a total human brother. Yes, like he's totally, yeah, yeah. It's really well done. And he that even, way. Um, even their dad says at one point that he wishes he was more into sports and Adam's more into skateboarding. So he didn't always feel like he lived up to his parents' expectations as well. No, because as you get further away from someone who has died, I find that we often rewrite history in our heads and make them perfect humans. And this was yeah. such a story that I felt like this was a memory from sisters who remembered things that were imperfect. And that was, yeah. I felt, gave it a good grounding. It was really well done. Yeah, thank you. Um, I love writing about this age group and I get the sense that you do too, but why these two protagonists? Why did you make two sisters? Why did you set them at this time in their lives? Yeah, um, I really like writing about young adults just because I find it's such a time of self-discovery and transformation. And the twins are actually 14 at the beginning of the story. They turn 15 and their mother tells them that they're straddling childhood and adulthood. Um, I thought it was an interesting time, you know, that leap because in Canada, we don't start high school until grade 10, but in the States, it's grade nine. So they're technically would still be in junior high um, here. Um, Claire is more mature than Audrey, who wants to hold on to her childhood a little bit longer, and she's still acting out scenes with her toys. And I guess I thought it was an interesting idea that in a twin relationship, one twin could just so significantly outgrow the other twin. And Audrey, Audrey was the character who came to me first. I wanted to write a novel that shows how everyone can feel like outsiders sometimes. So Audrey's felt like an outsider her entire life and has been bullied by her classmates and has this idea that Claire has everything figured out and she's popular. 
um, when in reality, Claire is still discovering her gender identity. And when she starts to show her true self, she's made fun of by the very same kids that bullied her sister. There really is no way to play uh, to please high school people. Just so you know, humans <laughs> out there, there's nothing you can do. They're going to make fun of you no matter what you are. Um, so welcome to everyone. <laughs> um, how about the challenges and benefits of writing that kind of dual point of view voice thing? I thought that was a really cool thing, um, but I don't know how I would do it in my own writing. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it, um, it actually started out as a short story about Audrey from my undergrad writing class. And then when I went back to it um, years later to turn it into a novel, um, all I knew at that time is that Audrey wants to return to Claire's school, Claire doesn't want her to, and I didn't know why. So as soon as I started exploring why Claire doesn't want her there, then I realized it should be a dual point of view so I could explain her perspective as well. And um, I really like that dual point of view allowed me to show events from both twins' perspectives. So near the beginning, we hear Claire's story that I just read, her perspective for what happened when um, Adam came to pick up Audrey from the karate lesson. And then later we hear Audrey's full story about what happened and actually why she wanted to leave. So it just gives really an opportunity cool to show both sides. Yeah. Did you have any trouble selling that to your editors or were they cool with it from, from off the top? It was from off the top because I'd written the whole book first and then I got an agent and then she sold it. So it was like that already. And how much research did you have to do into this? Because some of this, like you said, you're pulling from your own life experiences, your yeah. own griefs. But how much research did you put into developing I these characters? To, I had to research um, mostly for Claire's side, definitely. Um, so that was a lot of conversations with people in the LGBT community and friends and family. And then, but then also on Audrey's side too, because she's neurodiverse, but she has aspects of ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. And so I was struggling with, whether or not this character could have both. And it was actually a character that I wrote and somebody um, at the university said, I think she might have autism. And I wasn't entirely sure. So her character really evolved. And I had a psychiatrist read her over and she said, I think it's the comorbidity. So oh. where you can have both, but they're both under the umbrella of being neurodiverse. Got it. Yeah. Well, we've gone over time and I apologize because I was really enjoying. Um, so that happens sometimes. But I want to give people the opportunity to follow Alexandra. So please do follow Alexandra. Find out more about what she's working on. You can get her book. Um, can you show us the book again? Yes. From elomino.ca and probably, is it out now? It's out now, right? It's out on Tuesday, September. It's out 10th. on Tuesday. Happy book birthday. Yeah, thank you probably from your independent bookstores. So go get this book, people. And thank you so much, Alexandra. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Anytime. Talk to you later. Great. Thank you so much, Angela. And um, thank you to all of our readers today. Uh, <clears throat> uh, don't forget to visit Elemento Bookstore to find books by any and all of today's authors. Um, we will be back tomorrow for more kids and teens programming from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. You can find our full schedule at toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. Let me run our banner here in case anybody missed that. Full schedule down here. Um, if you're looking for on-demand programming for kids and teens, please visit our friends at the Telling Tales Festival at tellingtales.org. The Word on the Street is funded in part by the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. We acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, the Toronto Arts Council, and Ontario Creates. Ce projet est financé en partie par le gouvernement du Canada, le gouvernement de l'Ontario, et la ville de Toronto. Thank you for joining us, and we will be back tomorrow. <laughs>